Hi, I'm Charles with Anycap. This is my recap for the anime Deranged Detective. If you like my recaps, please consider subscribing. The story begins as a woman who was a bit too generous with some lipstick, named Amamaya, is furious to hear that there has been a fifth victim and the culprit has the same MO. She urgently instructs her investigators to expand the scope of the investigation, but turns to our protagonist named Totomaro and tells him that he can just go home and sleep. Totomaro portrays a tireless warrior by explaining that he is completely capable of working through two nights in a row and he can power through how tired he is. Amamaya doesn't want to be misunderstood and ruthlessly explains that someone as useless as him hanging around will only make things harder. Afterwards, a man named Kiko sympathizes with the discount detective since if Totomaro doesn't show some results soon, he might get kicked out of Investigation Division 1. Kiku reminds Totomaro how much of a garbage detective he is since he was once fooled by a culprit and let them get away three times. As if that wasn't bad enough, Totomaro has also had the cops called on him after he went into a neighborhood after dark to get some statements. Kiku likes how earnest Totomaro is but points out that that side of him makes him a terrible detective. Totomaro shows that he isn't a terrible person though as he points out that all the citizens are terrified with the serial murders going on and it's agonizing for him to just stand by. The old man clearly has something planned when he strangely licks his fingers to point out that there are already 5 victims and there haven't been any significant developments in the investigation. Investigation Division 1 is clearly having trouble so he thinks that there is only one person who can crack the case. This person is a bit of a sleuth and he's definitely not an ordinary detective. Totomaro goes to the guy's apartment and admires how sleek the sleuth looks in a picture. The sleuth works as the building manager so Totomaro wonders if it's because his detective business isn't doing so well. Totomaro goes to ring the bell but is shocked to hear a voice say, don't get your hopes up. A second attempt at the bell and the voice says, do it yourself. Totomaro's confusion only upsets the voice since it doesn't like that kind of attitude from someone asking him for a favor. The voice tells him to go back to the shrine and ask the gods for help again. Totomaro has no clue how the voice knew that he did that and the voice tells him to go away. Totomaro explains that Kiko sent him which gets the guy to come out but Totomaro is shocked by his look. This guy has a clump of seaweed where his hair should be and is all tatted up which is much different from his clean past. Not only that, his eyes are completely dead now. They don't even reflect light anymore and even a dead fish's eyes do that. Totomaro welcomes himself inside the guy's apartment and wonders if the guy's cat is dead. It's not and the guy named Komonohashi explains that he went to school with Kiko's son. Kiko is worried that Komonohashi just sits around crying all day and he can't say it isn't true. Totomaro panics when Komonohashi smashes his face into the ground but realizes that the floor is covered in cushions. Komonohashi explains that it's his floor of laziness and it knows his daily routine of despair and boredom. Komonohashi doesn't have a TV, internet, or even a cell phone. Nothing good comes from the outside so he cut off the world. He is completely withdrawn and claims that he has hit the depths of despair. He tries to get rid of Totomaro so he can continue enjoying his floor of laziness but Totomaro tells him that he needs something. Komonohashi refuses without even hearing what it is and explains that he isn't the first to come to him. Kiko has sent others to be his partner as well. Young brilliant officers only interested in promotions. He turned them all away after knocking them down a peg. It's clear that Kiko really wants to help him make a comeback but Komonohashi reveals that he is not a detective anymore. Totomaro tries to tell him about the murders but Komonohashi just screams really loudly to drown him out. Totomaro points out that he's trying to say something but Komonohashi tells him that that's fine since he's trying to keep him from talking anyway. Still not moving a single inch from his glorious floor of laziness, Komonohashi explains that he doesn't want anything to do with unsolved cases and refuses to listen. Totomaro points out that people's lives are on the line but the floor loving jerk states that it's not his problem. Totomaro concludes that Komonohashi is way too depressed and there's no way he would be able to deduce anything. Komonohashi is glad to see him leaving and tells Totomaro that he's better off asking the gods for help anyway. Totomaro wonders how he knew about the shrine and this is where we get our first glimpse of Komonohashi's brilliance. He points out the pine pollen on Totomaro's shoulder and explains that he could only have gotten that from a specific path near the shrine. Totomaro's unopened can of coffee in his pocket and jangling of the change in his other pocket made him realize that Totomaro broke a bill in order to offer a coin to the gods at the shrine. 
Of course, Totomaru is amazed by his deduction skills, but Komonohashi doesn't stop there. The lazy genius uses several of Totomaru's behaviors to deduce that he was raised by his grandparents. He's also able to tell that Totomaru is worried about getting fired, which is why he came for help. Komonohashi, seemingly unable to put a stop to his own godlike detective skills, keeps going, but Totomaru stops listening since he's already convinced that this way too depressed guy might be able to solve the case. Unfortunately, Komonohashi continues to refuse, so Totomaru comes up with a brilliant idea to yell the case details as loud as he can. His genius plan is foiled though when he notices that Komonohashi has earplugs on. Totomaru desperately pleads with him, but everything stops when Totomaru gets a call from his boss. Komonohashi takes his earplugs out to tell him not to take calls there, but it's too late. Amamiya explains that there has been a sixth victim and their body was found at a park in Shibuya. Totomaru is the closest, so she rushes him to investigate. He prepares to leave, but is shocked as something strange begins to happen to Komonohashi. Komonohashi explains that once he learns about a case, he can't hold himself back any longer, but he can't be allowed to solve cases anymore. He states that of course he wants to be a detective. Unraveling mysteries and solving cases is what gives meaning to his life. Not being able to makes him feel like he's going to go insane. That's why he cut himself off from the world, avoided people, and lived as a hermit by being a day sleeper. The problem is that he has a fatal flaw as a detective. A truly troublesome one, one that no doctor has been able to fix. Totomaro, showing off his probably not so good detective skills, deduces that Komonohashi must be sick. His body must be incredibly weak and frail, which is why he made the floor out of cushions. Komonohashi demands that he leave and states that as long as he takes sleeping pills to knock himself out for 3 days, he will be okay. Totomaru refuses to leave without him since he doesn't want Komonohashi to waste his talents and points out that there is nothing more important than stopping criminals. Komonohashi tries to tell him that that's not the issue, but Totomaru begs for Komonohashi to trust him and promises to back him up however he needs. Komonohashi can't believe how naive he is as he calls him a fool, but does agree to help. However, he tells Totomaru to listen carefully as he explains that no matter what, Totomaru cannot take his eyes off of him. Totomaru, clearly oblivious to what's really going on, promises to push Komonohashi in a wheelchair if he starts feeling sick. Komonohashi has no clue what he's talking about and informs Totomaru that they will be running to the crime scene. The run has Totomaru questioning his life choices, showcasing his undeniable talent for couch marathons over actual ones, and Komonohashi explains that he stays fit as a hermit using the gym he built in his apartment. They are informed that the victim was a private investment broker named Okamasa, and he was on his way to a business party the night before. Komonohashi then shocks everyone when he gets up close and personal with the stiff. Even more strangely, he begins to speak to it. He asks it how it could drown in a place with no water, and why did he hand over his valuables without a fight? The policeman is shocked since Komonohashi has no knowledge of the other victims, but seems to know a lot about what happened. Komonohashi explains that corpses want to talk and you just have to learn to listen. The white froth on its mouth indicates the possibility of drowning. Clothes show no signs of struggle and his suit shows that he was wealthy. The tan line on his wrist says that his watch was stolen. Totomaru seems to just now realize what a good detective looks like and is amazed to see that he's totally correct. Over the last 9 months, 5 people have been killed at irregular intervals with that exact MO. All their valuables were stolen, but they had no external injuries. Testing revealed no alcohol or drugs in their system, and they were all found drowned in places with no water. Komonohashi looks at a map showing where the victims were last seen and where they were believed to be going. On it are a date, a celebration, a class reunion, a wedding, and a birthday party. He uses it to narrow down the search area, but Totomaru points out that there's nowhere in that area with enough water to drown in. Still not realizing that he's terrible at his job, he also points out that he can't even think of a place where a grown man can be drowned without him putting up a fight. Luckily for Totomaru, Komonohashi isn't useless like him and has thought of a great place where that could happen. He's glad to see that he isn't rusty, even after a 5 year hiatus, and celebrates with his new friend. Everyone is shocked to see him be so casual with a dead body, but he explains that it's just his style. He states that if you treat them with respect and kindness, the dead will open their hearts to you. Komonohashi tells them that it's time to go and shocks everyone once more when he reveals that it's time to arrest the culprit. Totomaru can't believe that he already knows who it is since the police investigated for 9 months and couldn't crack the case. 
The master of deduction explains that that's what he's there for, but Totoro still can't believe it took him only like 3 minutes. Komonohashi calls him Toto and tells him to get out some money as they leave. Moments later, they're at a clothing store where Toto finds himself dressed up like a pimp. Komonohashi tells the rapper Wannabe that he'll be going undercover as a wealthy man and they will also have to do something about his hideous head of hair. They go to get him a haircut and Totomaro states that he will probably fall asleep since he has worked two nights in a row. Komonohashi is surprised to hear that he isn't the only idiot that has stayed up two nights for work but recommends that Toto should stay awake. Totomaro begins to think that Komonohashi might be a bit unstable and wonders if he should really be following what he says. I guess he just ignores that feeling as he heads inside and prepares for his haircut by removing his ridiculous looking coat while Komonohashi enjoys some black sugar syrup outside. The barber is amazed to hear that Toto has done well in the stock market and has him put his head in a shampoo station. After a moment, the man checks to see if Toto will respond to him, but Toto doesn't say a word. This barber is clearly evil as he begins to fill the basin with water to drown Toto, but Komonohashi arrives to stop him. He explains to the sinister stylist that lockpicking is a hobby of his, just as Totomaro emerges from the water. He tells Komonohashi that he held his breath for a minute just like he told him to do, but he still has no clue what is happening. Komonohashi explains that he was going to be murdered in a way that only a barber could pull off. The genius detective then reveals his deductions. None of the victims had any drugs in their system, but they didn't put up a fight either. The secret behind this is that the shampoo station was filled with oxygen deficient air. Air with an oxygen saturation below 18. If a person takes a single breath of air when it's less than 10, they faint. This could easily be achieved by using some dry ice. If Totomaro had breathed in, he would have passed out and drowned. The next clue was that the victims were all men whose hair was growing out. They all had big events lined up like parties and reunions that they'd naturally want to look good for, so going to a barber made sense. This absolute genius of a human being then narrowed things down even further by determining that it had to be a shop targeting new customers. So he focused on places in the victims overlapping areas of movement that accepted walk-ins. The scene of the crime also had to be somewhere people couldn't see in from the outside and somewhere you could get dry ice nearby. This guy's barbershop fit all the criteria. Komonohashi is almost done showing off his 1000 IQ when he states that the barber profession lends itself to chatting up clients so the killer could learn all sorts of things about his victims. To use that against him, Komonohashi had Toto dress in expensive clothes and tell a story about hitting it big in stocks. He made him play exactly the kind of wealthy walk-in the culprit prefers. The murderous scissor wielder who just stood there and listened to that entire speech just now realizes that they are cops and tries to run. The detectives corner the psycho barber and he explains that he was murdering people for the money. Totomaro is disappointed to hear he killed 6 people just for money so the barber explains that he doesn't feel guilty at all since he was screwed over by the rich first. He has crippling debt but Komonohashi couldn't care less and he shocks Totomaro when he tells the barber to jump off the building. He states that someone who devalues the lives of others has no right to keep living in this world and instructs him to jump again. Totomaro can't believe what he is hearing and we see that something happens with Komonohashi's eyes that makes the barber agree to do it. Toto is worried that people might listen to Komonohashi when he makes crazy demands like that and sees that the barber is actually going to do it. Komonohashi writhes in pain so Totomaro is left to try and stop the man. Komonohashi seems to snap out of it and Totomaro explains that the man jumped. Komonohashi is completely beside himself as he exclaims that he did it again and wished he never trusted someone else. However, he's shocked when Totomaro tells him to stop muttering and help him. Komonohashi is clearly a genius but even he can't believe that Toto managed to save the culprit. Komonohashi wonders if without any hesitation whatsoever, Toto put his own life on the line, but then realizes that isn't it at all. Instead, it's the opposite, Toto's just a pure naive fool and his body must react before reason kicks in. Totomaro wants him to stop talking to himself like a lunatic and help him, but Toto ends up falling. Just before gravity can introduce Totomaro to the pavement below, Kamonohashi saves them both. He proudly announces that he has changed his mind and now feels that there are infinite possibilities. At his house, Totomaro's mouth nearly drops to the floor as Kamonohashi reveals that his flaw is actually a sickness where he kills the culprit. 
He explains that he has no conscious memory of doing so, but apparently he always pressures the culprits to their death. By the time he comes back to his senses, it's too late. That's why his solved case rate is an amazing 100%, but his arrest rate is an insanely low 0%. That's why he was forbidden to act as a detective and why he cut himself off from cases. However, Toto has broken his disgraceful streak and it's clear now why Kiko sent Totomaru. What Kiko must have realized was that Kimonohashi doesn't need some brilliant partner at his side. What he needs is a pure naive fool. Totomaru realizes he is this fool and Kimonohashi tells him that they will be partners. He tells him to bring every case he stumbles upon to him. Kimonohashi explains that he will let Totomaru take all the credit, so starting today he will be a great detective. A look into the past shows a classroom full of shocked students. They all gasp in amazement when they see that one student managed to crack a case. The murder was a cold case and everyone said it would never be solved. They all agree that the new student is unbelievable, the greatest the school has ever seen, and begin to wonder how he can understand how criminals think. This feat was so incredible that the professor explains that once this student graduates, it could be the end of unsolved cases around the world. We find that this student was Kamonohashi. He was flattered by their praise and stated how devoting himself to becoming a detective was his life's calling. Back to the present, Totomaru goes to see Kamonohashi and is surprised to see that the once sad depressed loner is now excited to hear what their next case is. He hopes for a case that will send his heart dancing, but there really isn't one. This bad news sends Kamonohashi straight to his floor of laziness, where he mumbles frantically. Toto tells him to speak up, so he does, but it's only to call Toto useless. Kamonohashi tells him that he is wasting his overflowing passion for solving mysteries and the greatest talent Blue has ever seen. He explains that Blue is the world's preeminent detective training academy and an incredible 100% of the best detectives graduated from there. The best of all of them was Kamonohashi. He had the top scores and they said he was the greatest genius to ever grace the school. This is incredible to Totomaru but Kamonohashi explains that something went terribly wrong. During a practical exercise, all of the suspects Kamonohashi went after died, which put him under suspicion. He was expelled from Blue and barred from obtaining a detective's license. A detective's license is a passport he needs to solve the toughest mysteries. Without it, he is not permitted access to any case, and if he breaks the rules, Blue will punish him with death. Totomaro, a genius in his own right, points out that Kamonohashi was just investigating the case he just solved. Kamonohashi says that that was unavoidable, but from now on, on the surface, Toto will be doing the investigating, while he controls Toto from behind the scenes. Toto likes the idea, but doesn't like the sound of being controlled. Kamonohashi apologizes for his poor choice of words, and explains that what he meant to say was that Toto is his puppet. Things won't be so bad as Kamonohashi states that all he will do is conceal his identity, go with Toto to crime scenes, and give him instructions. Toto wonders if he could just do that over the phone, but Kamonohashi refuses. He wants to pay his respects to the dead and meet them for himself. His plan sounds great in theory, but Toto explains that he isn't the one who decides who the big cases go to. That's his boss, Amamaya. Kamonohashi, who has practically become one with his beloved floor of laziness, instantly starts doing his genius detective thing on a picture of Amamaya. Toto is in the picture, so he wasn't the one that took it. The reason neither of them are looking at the camera is that it was taken in secret. He is correct and Toto explains that a coworker who says he wants Amamaya Senpai to step on him, sent it to him. Toto reveals that he's scared of Miss Permanent Scowl and recounts what happened earlier that day. A body was found so she prepared to investigate it and the always eager Totomaro asked to go with them. Miss Never Smile declined but gave him something else to do and put the assignment in his binder. Kamonohashi is surprised to hear that Totomaro is taken seriously enough to have his own binder like the others but Toto explains that it's just filled with odd jobs or low priority cases. People secretly call it the trash bin. Kamonohashi surprisingly gives comforting words when he states that one day Totomaru will have the last laugh, but instantly kind of ruins it when he hilariously adds, one day the trash man will rule over all of humanity. As for today's trash, Totomaru explains that there was a report about missing money from a piggy bank and it ended up at Division 1 by some mistake. It's what could be called an utterly impossible crime, but Totomaru assumes that Komonohashi doesn't seem like he'd be interested in the theft of small change. He couldn't be more wrong however as this case surprisingly manages to peel Komonohashi away from his trusty floor of laziness. Komonohashi instantly disguises himself and explains that the duty of solving cases everyone else has abandoned falls to him, 
the most talented man in Blue's history. Toto steps on his seemingly dead cat, but Komonohashi tells him it's just sleeping. At the scene, Komonohashi introduces himself as Kamu, with Piggy Bank Emergency Services. It seems like Toto wasn't informed of this as he freaks out, telling Komonohashi to pick a normal name, since if he is found out, then he is a dead man. Just then, Komonohashi mistakes a pink suitcase for the piggy bank. They note how big it is and the homeowner explains that it belongs to her older sister who just returned home. She directs them to the living room where we find that Komonohashi knows way too much about piggy banks. He's amazed by this model as it's the one with a rubber valve from which it is completely impossible to remove coins, the impregnable pig. Totomaru is amazed by his knowledge, but the genius detective reveals that he just used Toto's phone to Google it. The pig isn't the most popular color and the girl explains that it's all her local store had left. She begins to explain that she noticed it was lighter when she returned home the day before, but Komonohashi interrupts her when he gets his mustache caught while looking at her older sister's jewelry. Totomaru wonders if he only came to get in the way, but Komonohashi points out how strange it is that the thief didn't steal the exposed jewelry. That's not all that's weird as the girl reveals that they were getting a lot of silent calls recently. This makes things incredibly clear for Komonohashi, which makes Toto think he has cracked the case, but he actually says that he gave up. This is because an impregnable piggy bank in a locked house is truly an utterly impossible crime. Just as Totomaru is shocked to see him chowing down on undiluted black sugar syrup, the older sister arrives. She explains that she was visiting her parents and she thinks that her younger sister is just imagining things. Totomaru thinks that she didn't really provide any new information, so Komonohashi wonders if they should just chalk it up to a trick of the mind. The little sister becomes frustrated as she is certain she didn't imagine anything, and exclaims that the pig was as heavy as an iron statue before. That's exactly what Komonohashi wanted to hear, and states that if that's the case, then they should break the piggy bank open. After they do, the girl is certain that there was more change in there, but there's no way to be certain. She goes to count it, but Komonohashi instantly stops her. He explains that Toto will be sending them to forensics for fingerprinting, and shocks Toto when he says he will be going for a walk. They meet up later just as Totomaru is told that the younger sister fingerprints were not on any of the coins. Totomaru is shocked to hear that Komonohashi expected that, but way more surprised to find that they are at Amamaya's crime scene. She reminds Totomaru that he wasn't supposed to come, but Komonohashi doesn't even address her and shocks everyone when he goes into the crime scene. Komonohashi finally addresses her, but it's only to ask what she would do if Totomaru solved her case. Angry boss lady will allow him to try, but explains that if he can't make her happy, then he is fired. Komonohashi doubles down on his shocking behavior by getting up close and personal with the corpse again. He tells it that he is glad to finally meet him and vows to avenge his death. Komonohashi tosses a bag to Totomaru and tells him that he is up. Moments later, Totomaru addresses everyone and begins by solving the mystery of the piggy bank. Amamaya wants him to just skip that part since petty cases like that have nothing to do with Investigation Division 1. Totomaru is startled, but Komonohashi quickly retorts that it was a case from Investigation Division 1's trash bin. Totomaru proceeds by explaining that, according to the forensic results, the coins in the piggy bank only have the older sister's prints on them. The older sister assumes that it means that only the money her sister put in was stolen, but that can't be since you can't take money out without breaking it. Totomaru struggles to answer, but Komonohashi calms him down and reminds him of the little gift he got Toto while on his walk. Totomaru explains that getting the coins out without breaking the bank is impossible, but replacing a broken one entirely isn't. Everyone is shocked as he explains that there weren't fewer coins inside because they were stolen, the previous bank was just broken. And in order to hide that, someone purchased a replacement and put the other coins inside. He accuses the older sister, but she points out that she wouldn't have to hide something like that and would just tell her little sister. Totomaru is flustered again, but Komonohashi points out to him that his voice is beginning to crack and calms him down once more. The recomposed Totomaru explains that her reason for hiding is right there on the riverbank. He shocks everyone more as he states that it was a murder. Things really come to light when he explains that the man was her stalker and he was the one making the silent phone calls. He waited for her one day and chased her into her own living room. There was the piggy bank as heavy as an iron statue, so she struck and killed him with it. When she did, the piggy bank shattered and blood got all over the coins. In order to conceal her crime, she bought a new one and tried to fill it with other coins. That's why only her prints are on them. Finally, she brought the body there. She used the suitcase in the entryway to move it. Given its size, it's far too large for just an overnight stay with her parents. Amamaya can't believe the two mysteries were connected, and Totomaru's just relieved that he managed to say everything. 
The little sister refuses to believe it all, but the older sister crumbles under her own guilt and admits to everything. Totomaru tries to point out how it was the stalker's fault, but Amamaya explains that concealing a murder is still a legitimate crime. Before anyone can even digest what just happened, Kimono Hashi shockingly steps forward and tells the older sister to go drown. He states that someone who kills another and hides it has no right to live in this world. Totomaru is stunned to see that Kimono Hashi is doing that thing where he pressures criminals to death, and doing it right in front of everyone. Amamaya strangely admires how cool what he is doing is, but Totomaru rushes in to tell everyone that he's just talking to himself. Kimono Hashi is still in that mode as he tells her to drown herself in the river and we see that his eyes have hypnotized her. She rushes off to drown herself and Kimono Hashi can't help but repeat the words go drown over and over. Amamaya stops her for a moment but the girl gets away. The older sister repeats those same words and begins to drown herself. However, just then, our impulsive protagonist acts without thinking at all and dives in after her. After a tense moment, the girl is relieved to see that her sister is safe. Moments later, Kimono Hashi snaps back to reality, consumed with guilt when he realizes that he once again pressured someone to take their own life. However, the genius detective is able to find some relief since she is safe and he has Toto to thank for that. Later, Detective Always Cranky explains to Toto Morrow that the case has been closed. They found fragments of the piggy bank and the stalker's hair. His blood and prints were also at the house. If they acknowledge that the acts were in self-defense, they may take that into consideration for her dumping his body as well. Totomaro hopes they do, but Amamaya points out that there are more pressing matters and tells Totomaro that him and his friend violated regulations. Totomaro expects her to completely blow up with rage, but when he lies and tells her that his friend's name is Kamu, she instantly changes her attitude. Later, Totomaru goes to see Komonahashi and is shocked when he asks for the next case that will send his heart dancing. He says he was just kidding, but it's clear that he wasn't when his body goes completely limp. Totomaru can't help but think that Komonahashi is really odd. He is obsessed with cases and is unreasonable, so Totomaru never wants to work with him again. Komonahashi composes himself to tell Toto to hold his head up high, since for a pure naive fool, he did incredibly good work. Toto accepts yet another backhanded compliment and thinks that, despite all of Kimono Hashi's flaws, Toto still has a part of himself that is hoping for another difficult case. A part that's looking forward to Kimono Hashi's deductions and the thrill of solving a mystery. Kimono Hashi wants to mark the day a special occasion and shocks Toto when he states that it's the day his puppet was born. Elsewhere, Blue's principal, Emmy, is asked if she remembers the man named Kimono Hashi. Of course she remembers as he was the man with the highest marks in the history of Blue. She is told that he has been suspected of resuming detective work. The instructor of disguise wonders if that may be the end of unsolved cases as they know them in Japan, but another instructor reminds him that all of the culprits in the case he handled died. They all fear that Kimonohashi may give rise to yet another tragedy, which is why they expelled him and barred him from obtaining a detective license in the first place. The principal makes her decision. Blue's entire goal is to train detectives to ensure that justice is never overshadowed by evil so they cannot have a detective who kills people. For this reason, she orders an investigation of Komonahashi, and the menacing looking tracking instructor volunteers to do it. The principal makes it very clear to this guy that looks like he has bad intentions that their goal is nothing more than to verify the intel they received. She fears that if they agitate Komonahashi, then it will only give him the opportunity to escape. She tells the tracking instructor to refrain from direct contact as much as possible. Even if he catches him in the act of sleuthing, he is to report back first. Kimonohashi is in great danger as the principal explains that if they find that he is acting as a detective, they cannot allow another tragedy to happen again and he will have to be punished to the greatest extent. Meanwhile, Totomaro receives a call and urgently rushes to Japan's version of Walmart with the cat mascot. Foolishly, he expected an emergency but is shocked to find that Kimonohashi is just upset that they won't let him start a tab and Kimonohashi just wants Toto to pay for his stuff. Totomaro thought that Blue was after Komonohashi's life or something, but Komonohashi points out that it's much worse than that. His cat's life is on the line if it doesn't get some food in its belly. Totomaro can't believe Komonohashi has survived this long without shopping for himself before, but Komonohashi explains that people from the apartments bring him things. The two are given a ticket for a raffle where they need to spin a wheel to decide their prize. Seemingly forgetting about his probably already dead cat, Komonohashi gets really into it. He thinks they should play rock, paper, scissors to see who spins the thing, but Totomaro just lets him do it. Totomaro couldn't be less enthused, but Raffleman can tell Komonohashi's going to get something good since he's raring to go. Komonohashi gives the thing a good turn, and the man loudly announces that he has won the grand prize, a hot spring vacation. 
This guy says it's perfect for the two of them since it's a couple's package, but Totomaru is the only one that tries to correct him. Komonohashi decides that he will just go by himself twice, but that's not how it works. They have no choice but to go together. Komonohashi registers himself as Kamu and Totomaru as the pure naive detective, much to Toto's disliking. They leave but we see that the tracking instructor has already found him and now knows about the hot spring vacation. On their way there, their driver gives them a pamphlet of the inn and he explains how lucky they are since it was pouring rain the day before. He also tells them a charming story about how long ago, fall leaves on the mountain turned a certain crimson called Benny. A lord saw it reflected in the hot spring and that's how Benizome Hot Springs got its name. Totomaro begins to change his mind about the entire thing as everything looks very beautiful and extremely relaxing in the pamphlet. However, Komonohashi tells the driver that they won tickets for the annex building and the man's tone completely changes as he apologizes profusely. He gives them a different pamphlet that's just for the annex building, but Totomaro is shocked to see that it's just some hand-drawn junk. The man drops them off near the annex building and leaves faster than when my dad went to get the milk. They quickly realize why when they see that the annex building looks pretty run down, like a typhoon hit just this one spot. They are welcomed by the inn owners and their purple haired employee who is actually the tracking instructor in disguise. The guy that looks like he washed his hair with grape juice thanks Totomaro for his service with the police force. Totomaro has no clue how he knew his job and the man explains that it was because of Totomaro's shoes. The leather of the toes are scuffed and that only happens if you run all out in them. The only professionals who run in their leather shoes are police detectives chasing down criminals. Totomaro is amazed by his deduction, but Komonohashi doesn't want Toto to be fooled. He explains that when it comes to professionals running in leather shoes, he points out that a reporter might be just as likely. Komonohashi out deduces the other guy as he is determined that he only knew Toto was a cop because that is what Komonohashi put on the reservation form. We see that old purple hair is actually impressed, but he just explains that it's a little welcoming trick he likes to do. Inside, the man explains that the bath is open anytime up until 8am the next day, and dinner will be served later at 7pm. Komonohashi can't stop deducing the heck out of everything and realizes that with the dinner at a predetermined time, that must mean other guests are there as well. He is of course right as there are three other parties there. The two head to their room and we see that the instructor is strangely excited. He is amazed by Komonohashi's deduction as it confirms that it's really him. Very soon after, the guys enjoy a bath, but Komonohashi wishes it was crimson like in the driver's story. He reveals that the driver's story is just what they tell the public, but there is also a secret legend. The river there often overflows and this caused problems for the villagers. The brilliant villagers decided to sacrifice a young lady to it and the next day the floodwater went away. However, they say that for days afterward, the river and hot spring ran crimson. Totomaru is in disbelief of the terrifying story and Komonohashi explains that it was in the handmade pamphlet the driver gave them. Just then, Totomaru notices that Komonohashi's tattoo is bigger than he thought. Komonohashi explains that it's actually a scar. He once suffered injuries all over his body but that was the only one that scarred. It looks like a number and Komonohashi says that is why he likes it so much. It looks like the number 6 which is a number he associates with his birth. To help Toto understand, he compares it to Toto having a tattoo of his grandma since he loves her so much. Afterwards, they go to dinner where Totomaru is shocked by the clump of slime Komonohashi ordered. Komonohashi has to explain to the uncultured simpleton that it's rice covered in his beloved black sugar syrup. The genius credits it with being the source of his brain power and explains that he also drinks black sesame paste to ward off anemia. Komonohashi then turns his attention to the other guests. There is a couple there where an impatient man wants his wife to admire the delicious meal and a young man by himself. Komonohashi, only using 1% of his power, points out how they were told that there were 4 parties staying there in total, so it seems someone has yet to arrive. However, Toto is surprised when Komonohashi says that 5 people is just perfect for something he has planned and even more shocked when he reveals that it's the Game of Life board game. Playing the game of life at a hot spring is strangely on the list Komonohashi made during his 5 year seclusion so Totomaru is terrified of what else might be on that list. Komonohashi surprisingly wants everyone to play but Totomaru explains that everyone is still eating and points out that it's more customary for people to play ping pong at hot springs. Komonohashi agrees to wait on the fun for a while so the two finish up their meal. Afterwards, they head to play a quick round of ping pong where Komonohashi finds an old scroll that tells the secret story of the crimson hue. This thing is pretty creepy looking and Komonohashi wonders if the death of a young woman really did dye all the waters red. 
They prepare for their match, but Komonohashi wants to up the stakes, and decides that whoever loses will have to be the winner's slave for life. Komonohashi isn't just a genius, he also has a powerful ping pong serve that Toto ends up sending straight through a window. Unfortunately, they only had one of those, so they head outside to retrieve it, but it's too cold and its mission failed. Komonohashi points out that he won, so Toto is his slave now. His first task is to steal unsolved case files from the station, but that's impossible. We then see that the fourth party has arrived late to the hot springs. Surprisingly, it's police superintendent general Amamaya, but she has made a grave mistake. Afterwards, the boys find that Amamaya had won second prize at Japan Mart and point out to her that she walked into the men's bath. She is worried that Kemu might think she is a pervert, but her embarrassment is spared when the woman in the couple yells out that she wants a divorce over something her husband said. He tries to tell her it was a joke, but she isn't buying it. The nosy Amamaya cries out that they shouldn't get divorced, but becomes upset when Totomaru wonders if she is drunk out of her mind. She heads to bed and the woman has calmed down a bit. Her husband recommends that she take a bath, so she agrees and apologizes for yelling. She leaves him there to just relax, giving our brilliant detective the perfect opportunity to ask the husband if he wants to play the game of life. The man agrees, so Komonohashi asks the lonely guy if he wants a do-over on his very obvious, tedious life. Toto asks him not to be rude, but the kid agrees to play anyway. Some time passes as Purplehead diligently checks the time, and the boys are in the middle of an intense game of life. Komonohashi is in last place, but he explains that that's only because he's playing fair this time. The young loner explains that he wishes they could really do their lives over this way, and so does the guy with the old ball and chain. It's pretty late, so they decide to call it a night, and leave the married guy with the most money to clean up since he is rich. They leave, but something isn't right as the instructor once again checks his watch. The next morning, a scream can be heard throughout the entire place. A mamaya is told by one of the workers that there's a dead girl in the women's bath. Everyone arrives, shocked to see crimson leaves in the bath, along with the dead body. It's the man's wife named Sachiko, and her husband arrives shocked since he thought she was sleeping. Amamaya can tell from the rigor mortis that her time of death was sometime between midnight and 2am. If you thought her going into the bath was shocking, Komonohashi one-ups her and gets up close and personal to the corpse like he always does and promises it that he will avenge it. Komonohashi points out that there aren't any obvious external injuries, but something clearly isn't right. Amamaya explains that there weren't that many fallen leaves there the night before, and the worker points out the obvious as the crimson layer on the water is like in the story. She thinks it might be a curse. Komonohashi pretends to wonder this too, but explains that Detective Totomaro just can't stop doubting people. He gives Totomaro a hint to do his thing, so Totomaro goes straight into detective mode. He asks if anything strange was noticed between the hours of midnight and 2am, but the owner explains that the inn is small, so they take turns on the night shift. Octopus Head reveals that he had the night shift last night. He was watching over everyone so he can provide a statement. He points out how they all saw the same thing. Only one individual returned to their room before the wife left for hers. Everyone is shocked when they remember who that was, and Purplehead looks right at Detective Amamaya. The others can't deny that she left and begin to think that she is the murderer. Our brilliant detective knows better though and confidently states that it wasn't her. However, it is someone else who is right there with them now. The others push back a bit since she was clearly the only one to have left. Komonohashi points out that it's true that Amamaya is the only one with an uncertain alibi, but her doing it is impossible. He is certain of this and he plans to prove it to them right now. Old Purple Hair gives a menacing look and is surprised to see that his chance to catch Komonohashi investigating has come so soon. He is the great tracking instructor from Blue and declares in his mind that Komonohashi is done for. He is then shocked when Komonohashi reveals that everything he was just saying about solving the case was actually coming from Totomaru. Toto wishes he wouldn't get carried away, but Komonohashi doubles down and puts on an absolute show. He pretends like Toto is telling him that they already have all the clues they need. In a panic, Toto can hardly form any words to say and just makes gasping noises. However, Komonohashi takes those noises and makes them seem like clues about the illustration of the secret of Benazomi and the water turned red with leaves. Everyone is familiar with the secret story about the girl that was sacrificed, everyone except Amamaya. Everyone else saw it in the taxi on their way there, but Amamaya didn't take a taxi and Totomaro realizes something. Komonohashi pretends that he's just following Totomaro's lead and explains that Amamaya never even had the opportunity to see the pamphlet so she didn't know the story. Therefore, she could not commit a murder made to replicate that story. This is why she isn't the culprit and our brilliant detective makes sure to give all the credit to Totomaro. The others are convinced since that story is kept a secret and there's no other way she could have known about it. 
Amamaya breathes a sigh of relief, but Squidhead is disappointed that Totomaro was actually the one that made all those deductions. Komonohashi then asks Totomaro who the real culprit is, but he wasn't prepared for that at all. Komonohashi just makes it seem like Totomaro hasn't decided yet, and he wants to say it with just some curse. The inn worker says that it could be since she saw a strange white mist rising from the river just after dinner. She thought it might have been a spirit and Komonohashi calls Totomaro over. Toto thinks that he wants to show him a clue that will surely break this case wide open, but Komonohashi just found their ping pong ball. Totomaro wants him to focus, but Komonohashi just wants to look for something to get the ping pong ball. They are surprised to see a random bath mat, and still all our genius detective can think about is if it can reach his precious ping pong ball. Amamaya interrupts them and Totomaro is certain that she's going to yell at him. However, she surprisingly thanks him for helping her, but it's pretty clear that her body is physically refusing to thank him as it looks like her head is going to explode. She can't continue the investigation herself because of the doubt, so she leaves the rest to Totomaro. Toto is incredibly honored, but she reminds him that she doesn't expect anything good from him, it's just that he is the only one there. Amamaya says that nothing has been going right for her and it all started when she walked into the wrong bath. This makes Komonohashi realize something and he compliments her on her good work. He tells her that she actually wasn't mistaken that night, but Sherlock's Riz hits harder than a tranquilizer dart and she passes out. The police arrive and purple-headed Four Eyes gives our boy a dirty look before they all return to their rooms. The tracking instructor goes into the room next to Komonohashi's and plans something devious. Some time passes as the cops do their thing and we see that Squidhead is trying to listen in on Komonohashi through the wall with a noise amplifying device. Totomaro arrives and explains to Komonohashi that according to the medical exam, the cause of death was heart failure. According to her husband, she had a long hanging heart condition. Purple hair with the thinnest eyebrows you will ever see creepily listens in and desperately waits for Komonohashi to say something that proves he has been investigating. Seemingly knowing everything, Komonohashi says that there is a caterpillar on the wall and gives it a good whack, completely blowing up the instructor's ears. Toto points out that there was no bug, and Komonohashi says of course there wasn't, he would never kill a bug anyway. Totomaro gets serious again and explains that he was told that the temperature difference between the inside and outside caused the heart failure. It was thermal shock. This is exactly as Komonohashi expected. He states that everything is coming together now and tells Totomaro that he is up. Everyone gathers once more and Totomaro declares that with the police's blessing, he will now solve the case. He reveals that it was definitely a murder and the person who did it is there now. Totomaro gets right to it by pointing out that the murderer had to have known that the victim had a weak heart, so it had to be the husband. He admits to knowing about her condition being her husband and all, but says that he would never think of hurting his wife. Besides that, he points out that he was in the lounge with everyone else at the time of her death. Totomaro acknowledges this but accuses him of only being with them so he could have an alibi. His real goal though was to set a very bold trap to lure his wife to her death. Totomaro then demonstrates how the husband left a bath mat covering the entrance to the bath to create a pitfall. Amamaya furiously points out that no one would fall for such a dumb trap, but Totomaro reveals that without her glasses, the wife had really poor vision. The bath mat was more than enough to fool the blind bat and the trap made her fall into the bath, a bath she would never stop soaking in. The worker points out that it was thermal shock that actually killed her and just falling into bath water isn't enough to stop a heart. Totomaro agrees but then reveals that the bath wasn't actually filled with warm water in that moment and it was actually freezing water. This is shocking as it's a free flowing hot spring so Totomaro has his assistant Komonohashi retrieve something that has the husband shaking in his shoes. It's a rain gutter that he found discarded in the river. The husband knew there was an elevation difference between the river and the bath, so he used two rain gutters. One drew the water from upstream into the bath. Then by drawing the hot water from the bath into the river, he was able to create a freezing cold spring. That also explains the white mist the worker saw. It wasn't a cursed spirit, it was just good old science since it was steam from the hot bath water hitting the cold river. The only hitch in the husband's plan was that the fallen leaves in the river from the heavy rains two days ago ended up in the hot spring. He couldn't pick out each individual one so he decided to make use of the secret legend. He doubled down on the fallen leaves by adding more and tried to make it look like the curse of the sacrificed woman. The husband reaches for his last defense and reminds everyone that she died in the women's bath. A man couldn't sneak in there long enough to set all that up. Totomaro has an answer for that as well, pointing out that if the husband knew no one would be coming, then that wouldn't be a problem. At dinner, the husband overheard that Toto and Komonohashi were going to play ping pong, so he knew no one would be in the men's bath for a while. He used that opportunity to swap the curtains marking the men and women's bath to send the ladies to the men's bath, ensuring that he would have the women's bath to himself. 
This also explains why Amamaya walked into the men's bath. Their ping pong match ended more quickly than the husband expected, so they went for a bath before he could swap the curtains back, and she walked in on them. The husband can't believe he is being accused and points out that there is no evidence. Of course, Tartamaro has a response to this as well, as he reveals that if they test the curtains, he is sure they will still find the husband's fingerprints. Those fingerprints have no reason to be there. He should have only been using the men's bath, so why would his prints be on the women's curtain rod? Totomaro challenges him to explain his way out of that one, but the man can't and he says he has been checkmated. Totomaro is just glad that he got all that out and the husband turns to the worker to apologize for failing. She is shocked to see that he really ended his wife, but the man explains that he did it for her since she always said his wife was in the way. Amamaya is furious at the lowlife since he let the dark force of his simpness control him into ending his own wife over an affair. Everyone argues but are then shocked when the normally very calm Totomaro loudly yells that the man ended his own wife. The man has no words left and is taken away. Totomaro wonders where Komonahashi is and goes to look for him after he sees something weird. Toto checks the forest and is called over by Instructor Squid. Toto can hardly recognize him after his glow up and the man explains that Komonahashi is just waking up. Totomaro is then shocked to find Komonahashi tied up on a tree. Komonohashi thought that he was just in a hot spring filled with black sugar syrup, so Totomaro must explain to the sugar lover that he was just dreaming. Purplehead finally introduces himself as Blue's tracking instructor named Spitzfire. He reveals that he came to investigate whether Komonohashi was acting as a detective. Komonohashi mocks Spitz as he reveals that he spotted him all the way back at the store when they won the raffle. Komonohashi confidently points out that he didn't do anything and Totomaro was the one that cracked the case. Spitz calls him a liar and hilariously says that a fool like Totomaro, who didn't even notice him, couldn't possibly make such brilliant deductions. Totomaro's pride is destroyed and Komonohashi tells Spitz to show him some proof. Spitz of course doesn't have any, but says he doesn't need any, since he is certain those were Komonohashi's amazing deductions. Komonohashi really starts antagonizing the guy now. He says that not only is Spitz bad at his specialty, shadowing and tailing, he is also illogical, and Komonohashi wonders how he became an instructor. On top of all that, he is a terrible kidnapper, just tying him up in a forest for anyone to see in broad daylight, and Komonohashi wonders how bad instructors are these days. Spitz doesn't seem to understand the situation, and tells Komonohashi that if he admits to investigating, he will ask for a lighter sentence. Komonohashi points out that Spitz definitely doesn't have the authority to do that, and begins doing his genius deducer thing. He points out that if Spitz were only there to see if he was investigating, he wouldn't need to disguise himself as a worker at the inn. However, Spitz still went through all the trouble of going undercover and interacting with them. If he was just there to observe, that would be very irrational. Not only is he exposing himself to his target, there's always the possibility that they might flee. Given Spitz's earlier threat, his phrasing, and his impatience, our big brain million IQ genius deduces that something else is at play. And it's a personal matter. Spitz either made a bet with someone about him investigating, or he was threatened. Komonohashi frees himself and wonders if there is a third reason, perhaps Spitz is in need of his abilities. Spitz has taken enough of a beating from all the deducing and admits to being utterly defeated. He desperately pleads for Komonohashi to lend him his skills. He explains that he only honed his tracking skills enough to become an instructor at Blue so that he could find the best detective to solve the mystery of his missing family. Unfortunately, no one there could help him and everyone he asked thought that only Komonohashi might be able to solve the case. Spitz is ecstatic that he was able to confirm that Komonohashi is the detective he had always been looking for, but Komonohashi refuses to help. Komonohashi points out that Spitz is an instructor at Blue. He doesn't even know him so only a fool would trust him. Spitz explains that he is a pretty good guy and he now feels really close to Komonohashi after investigating him for so long. Spitz is determined to prove his trustworthiness and states that he will go tell his superiors that Komonohashi isn't doing any detective work. He says that he will help Komonohashi with his detective work as well, but Komonohashi reminds him that it's Totomaro's detective work. Spit shows that he is a fan as he offers a happy coat to Komonohashi. Komonohashi rejects this dude again, and Totomaro tells him that Spitz doesn't seem like a bad guy. He wants Komonohashi to hear him out, so Spitz tells Toto that while he is not smart, he definitely has heart. He compliments Toto on solving the case, and leaves while telling them that he is available if they ever need a tracker. He takes off like Spider-Man while stating that he will definitely earn Komonohashi's trust. Komonohashi is clearly going to turn him down but does admit that Spitz's skills would be helpful in solving future mysteries. Komonohashi is intrigued by the missing family case but he explains that he simply can't trust Purplehead and if he betrays him he is done for. However, Komonohashi trusts Totomaro's judgment and Toto said he was a good person. 
Toto thinks that puts too much pressure on him, but Komonohashi says that they will simply have to see if he's trustworthy or not. Just like for everything else, Komonohashi has a plan and shocks Toto when he explains that he will just use spits until he drops. Totomaru knows that Komonohashi isn't a bad guy though, as he has never seen him abandon someone who's in trouble. Totomaru thanks him for helping Amamaya in the murder case, but he says that he was merely fulfilling his duty. However, the next scene shows a guy looking in his fridge as he makes a menacing smile. Sometime later, Totomaru is told that serial murders have been occurring and there will be a joint investigation. He is shocked to hear that some super skilled detective they call Eagle Eyed Kawasemi will be coming. Totomaru fanboys over him for a second as he points out that this great Kawasemi has a chance to become Superintendent General in his 20s. This upsets Amamaya though as she is aiming to be Police Superintendent General also. She then surprisingly reveals that Totomaru will be overseeing the joint operation, but the rude boss then mumbles under her breath that it's only because she would never lend Kawasemi any of her best men. Kawasemi arrives and we get to see just how insane this guy is. He uses a pair of tweezers to go around the room telling everyone their flaws. One guy's nails are too long, another guy has a button falling off, and some guy has his fingerprints all over his glasses. Kawasemi spares no one during his inspection rampage and he even plucks the hairs off a guy's face. He finishes up the group and states that chaos is the enemy of work. Totomaru is amazed and Amamaya seems annoyed as she points out that not a single thing can get past Kawasemi's eagle-eyed checks. We learn that she has a little bit of a pass with this guy, but that ended when they stopped working at the same location years ago. Kawasemi then turns his attention to Totomaro, so Totomaro nervously prepares for the eagle eye check of his life. Kawasemi's check is brutal as he has determined from his years of experience that Totomaro is so unsuited to be a detective that it's tragic, and he has zero aptitude. Amamaya and Kawasemi just stare at each other for a good second, and he finally points out that there is a bit of dust on her shoulder. Amamaya isn't having any of this fool's nonsense though. This ruthless boss blocks his little inspection tweezers and warns the guy she calls scum that if he even tries to touch her, she will slit his throat. Kawasemi's tool is all busted up, so he calls on his trusty partner Yamane to give him a fresh set. Kawasemi compliments Yamane as his right hand man and the humble guy just says that he's glad to be working with the greatest detective in history. Amamaya explains that Totomaru will be the person she sends for the joint investigation and our boy gets roasted as they go back and forth about how she is only doing that to spite Kawasemi. Kawasemi just acts like he can't even see Totomaru, and Amamaya points out how Toto should start appreciating her as a boss since at least she acknowledges his existence. At the crime scene, we learn that a truck driver found a dead person's body in his cargo. Totomaru arrives and is horrified to see that the victim's hands were cut off. Totomaru tries to cooperate with the other detectives but just ends up being completely ignored like he really doesn't exist. He realizes that he's probably just a hindrance to someone as great as Kawasemi, but our boy refuses to just stand by and watch. This is some refreshing confidence, but he doesn't know what to do now. Fortunately, Komonohashi appears from nowhere in a subtle disguise. Totomaru points out that no one asked for his help, but Komonohashi knows that Toto was at a loss because he always flaps his lips when he thinks to himself, so he is easy to read. Komonohashi makes his presence known to everyone and explains that he is a consultant in all matters involving hand. He then shockingly introduces himself as Tekamoma Komomi, the great hand puppet master. His card seems pretty legit and Kawasemi assumes that Amamaya sent him, but Kawasemi doesn't want some random civilian getting in the way. Komonohashi assures him that he isn't just some civilian and tells Kawasemi not to hold back as he clearly has something to say. Kawasemi instantly breaks out his tweezers to test how accurate Komonohashi's hand puppets are and is shocked to find that they are pretty realistic. Komonohashi explains that he insisted the maker of the puppet change the material because he too is a lover of accuracy. Apparently, Kawasemi is impressed because he allows Komonohashi to accompany him. Komonohashi is impressed as well, so Totomaru explains that Kawasami is the great eagle eye because he sees through everything in an instant. Komonohashi's admiration instantly turns to competitive rage as he crushes his poor puppet's face, and he states that no matter what, they have to catch the culprit first. Totomaru says that will be impossible because they aren't telling him anything about the case, but Komonohashi decides to go right to the source. Yamane explains that this case follows the same MO as three other murders. The perpetrator ends his victims with a single stab to the heart and then for some reason he severs their hands and takes them with him. This is some pretty creepy stuff so they call him the hand collector. The puppets think the name is pretty cool and Komonohashi gets excited about the terrifying case that not even the great eagle eye has been able to solve. Yamane explains that he and his amazing partner Kawasemi were informally questioning one of their suspects the night before. They were certain that this man was the hand collector, but he put up a huge fight and fled into an abandoned factory. There were only two ways in and out of the building, so they split up to catch the guy. 
Yamane found the culprit first and managed to handcuff him. Yamane hesitates to tell the rest of the story, so Kawasami arrives to reveal that the culprit managed to shake off Yamane. Kawasami arrived just after and the culprit came barreling towards him. Kawasami reveals that he couldn't stop the guy, so that is why he must be the one to close the case. Totomaru points out that they already know what the culprit looks like, so it won't be long before the guy is captured. This is true, but Kawasemi reveals one big problem. The man they believed to be the hand collector last night is now the handless corpse sitting before them. Our boys are shocked and Kamonohashi determines that the real hand collector must still be out there somewhere. He then does that crazy thing he does where he chats it up with the corpse. He points out how the guy is dressed lightly considering how cold it's been and determines that he must have been ended in a heated room. Kamonohashi then notices a tiny tattoo and incorrectly guesses that it's a piece of kelp. Yamane is quick to explain that it's actually a bird and says that he saw it when he handcuffed the guy. Kamonohashi becomes very concerned about something urgent but hilariously just says that he can't get the puppets off. Kawasemi is disappointed to see that nothing came from the puppet master jumping into the truck and tells him to just go home as he has no time for games. Afterward, Totomaru tries to help him get the puppet off but wonders why Kamonohashi came in the first place. Kamonohashi then gives a little smile as he easily releases the puppet and Totomaru goes flying into Yamane. Kawasemi scolds Toto for the chaos, but Komonohashi screams out how amazing Totomaru is. He states that everything is just like Toto said it would be. It's very clear now that Kawasemi is lying. Komonohashi uses this moment to explain that Kawasemi will not be the one to solve the case. It will be the pure naive fool, Detective Totomaru. Of course, Kawasemi is upset at the accusation and he asks Totomaru for proof. Komonohashi explains that Totomaru barreled into them on purpose to see how quickly Kawasemi reacted and Kawasemi didn't disappoint as he easily dodged him. Kamonohashi then points out that with such exceptional reflexes and physical agility, there's no way a handcuffed culprit would ever get past Kawasemi. Kawasemi is shocked to hear that Totomaru ran at him on purpose and realizes now that he is the subordinate of Amamaya's that he has heard of, the one that has been brilliantly cracking cases lately. Kawasemi admits to lying and explains that Yamame did handcuff the culprit, but he was actually the one that allowed him to get away. Kawasemi wasn't even present for it at all. Kamonohashi wants to know why he lied, so Kawasemi strangely begins his explanation by saying that on that day, Yamane was missing a button on his sleeve. Yamane is an outstanding subordinate, but the grotesque serial murders have been taking a serious toll on his mental health. Because of this, Yamane made a mistake when the pressure was highest in a very crucial moment. Kawasemi explains that he was fully aware of his subordinate's mental state, but failed to give him appropriate guidance. For this reason, he took full responsibility. That is why he covered for Yamane and said he was the one that let the culprit get away. Yamane feels the intense guilt and apologizes. Kamonohashi's annoying little puppet breaks the tension and points out that Yamane is missing a button on his sleeve again. Yamane realizes this and absolutely loses his mind. He looks for it frantically like a maniac and determines that it must have fallen off when Totomaru ran into him. His desperate search continues but the duck puppet reveals that he found it and it has given him the gift of vision as his new eye. Yamane is able to find relief as he exclaims that at least he was able to find something this time. Komonohashi strangely thanks him for saying that and adds that we only realize what's most important after it's gone. He then makes a phone call and Totomaru is shocked to hear that it's Spitz. Komonohashi had Spitz look into a bunch of stuff so Spitz reveals that the body in the truck is a guy named Minoru. Spitz is at his place right now and says that it's unreal. If there were a world competition for hand obsession, this guy would represent Japan and be guaranteed a top place. The guy even kept his collection refrigerated, three people's worth of hands, proving that the man in the truck is indeed the hand collector. Kawasemi is curious about what all that was but Totomaru has a hard time explaining. Luckily, Komonohashi shoots his delicious black sugar syrup all over Totomaru to break the tension and take Totomaru to get cleaned up. However, as he leaves, Komonohashi shockingly reveals to Kawasemi that when they get back, Totomaru said that he will solve the case and the duck tells him to look forward to it. In the restroom, Komonohashi silently explains everything and Totomaru shows great determination. When they return, Kawasemi condescendingly states that he will humor the nonsensical ramblings of a rookie detective. Totomaru says that the guy over the phone was a police officer, so the guy in the truck is definitely the hand collector. However, Yamane is quick to point out that the guy's hands are missing too. Totomaru says that was done to make them think there's another hand collector and it's the work of a copycat. That's already pretty clear to Kawasemi, so he wants to know why someone would go through all the trouble of imitating such a brutal murder. Totomaru then really drops the hammer as he reveals that the culprit didn't murder anyone. The real hand collector that is in the truck just took his own life. The hand collector stabbed himself in the heart, splattering blood on his jacket sleeves. In order to make his death look like a murder, someone removed and hid his jacket. That is why it seemed like he was dressed so lightly. 
The reason he took his own life was because once he was cornered by the two detectives, the serial killer had no choice but to accept his fate. Kawasemi, the great detective, is completely shocked and realizes that if everything is true, then the guy took his life in the abandoned factory. He is then horrified as he points out that he and Yamane were the only other people there, and that could only mean one thing. Totomaro says that it's exactly the case and reveals that the person in question was the first person to find the hand collector after he took his own life, and that is Yamane. Yamane tries to deny it, but Totomaro really goes into detective mode now. He points out that it must have been pitch black in the factory at night, so it would have been impossible to see anything. Totomaro also says that the hand collector's tattoo is very difficult to see in the first place and asks how Yamane instantly knew it was a bird. Yamane still frantically tries to deny it, so now Toto reveals that Yamane is hiding something else and can't get himself to tell Kawasemi. Toto puts everything out there and shockingly reveals that Yamane had lost his handcuffs. He was able to determine this when he noticed that after Yamane lost his button in front of them, he panicked and said I found it this time. In other words, he already lost something important to him something which might compromise police integrity. That is why Yamane was so on edge that day. So when he found that the hand collector had killed himself, Yamane came up with an idea. To make it seem like the hand collector fled after he handcuffed him, he hid his body, then he severed his hands. That way, when the body was found handless afterward, it would look like the hand collector had taken the cuffs along with the hands. No one would ever find out that Yamane lost them. Kawasaki instantly jumps to Yamane's defense, saying he would never do such a thing, but Totomaro stops him and explains that he is part of the problem. It's obvious how much Kawasemi values Yamane, but the pressure of being valued by such an uptight perfectionist meant that Yamane couldn't allow himself to be any less than ideal. Kawasemi is actually speechless and Yamane desperately apologizes for leaving a stain on Kawasemi's career. Yamane is completely broken and explains that the responsibility was too much for him to bear. He couldn't meet his expectations. Kawasemi explains that it will be difficult to reinstate him as a police officer, However, he isn't a terrible person and says that as long as Yamane has the will, he will be waiting for his partner to return. After Yamane is taken away, Kawasemi points out that there's no need for both members of a team to be police officers, and uses our boys who just solved the mystery as an example. They are shocked and Kawasemi reminds them not to underestimate his eyes. He tells Totomaro that just like he needed Yamane, the puppet master needs Totomaro to harness his full ability. Komonohashi is impressed by this point, but Toto jumps in to point out how much of a mess Komonohashi is without him, and the two bicker for a bit. Kawasemi watches them, impressed by Totomaro, and thinks about how Omamaya has a good detective on her hands. Sometime later, Totomaro goes to see Komonohashi, but finds him in super messed up shape with bloodshot eyes. Komonohashi is eager for another mission, but has become addicted to television, and one show in particular called Psychic Abilities Fact or Fiction. We then watch a live broadcast of this show, hosted by a woman named Ono. On the show, a psychic and a neurosurgeon go head to head in an attempt to verify psychic powers. The one demonstrating their power is a famous psychic named Toraj, and up against him is the genius neurosurgeon Mofu. This girl is fast asleep and Totomaro wonders if she is severely injured because of all the bandages. Mofu explains that she was just cutting an apple, but the knife got away from her and did some serious damage. Komonohashi explains that this girl is very odd, but she is a lot of fun to watch. Of course, Totomaro wonders if she's really a good neurosurgeon, so Komonohashi explains that her procedures are very precise, and she is considered a super doctor. However, she proves to be very clumsy as the audience breaks out in laughter when she accidentally clips her microphone to her face. The crowd marvels as Toraj explains that he will demonstrate how he can control someone's mind with just writing, and Komonohashi cheers him on. Toto is surprised to see that he believes in psychic powers, but he actually doesn't. Komonohashi just thinks that it would make solving crimes way more fun and challenging if it was real. Toraj plans to force someone to perform an action against their own will, and he does this by first offering to give someone $10,000 if they can resist doing what he tells them. They put headphones on a volunteer from the crowd, and Toraj writes the word jump on a card. The second the man sees the word, his body begins to act on its own, and he starts to jump. The crowd erupts with applause, and Toraj shows the man the next card that says run. The man begins running against his own will, amazing everyone and making them wonder if Toraj really has psychic powers. Komonohashi is a brilliant genius though, as he has noticed something, and he wonders if the neurosurgeon has noticed it as well. Mofu buzzes in and reveals that she used a nap to track the walking patterns of the volunteer. This volunteer's walking pattern is identical to the previous volunteer that the psychic had, so she determines that this so-called volunteer is actually a plant. He wasn't really chosen at random, and he is the same subject from the psychic's last demonstration. It was all staged, and she shows everyone the proof on her broken phone. 
Toraj says that these are all false accusations and begins writing a word that will prove that he is not working together with the volunteer. Toraj writes the word death on a card, meaning the guy will have to die if he reads it. Everyone is startled, but Mofu doesn't believe in psychic powers and is certain that this will not take his life. Toraj shows the man the card and he instantly collapses, horrifying everyone. Everyone begins to panic as the show is cut off and Komonohashi tells Totomaro that there is no time to waste. They arrive at the scene where Totomaro is told that they have confirmed the man's death. The police wonder who Totomaro's friend is and Komonohashi introduces himself as Kamoji, a superfan of the psychic. Komonohashi wastes no time in getting up close and personal with the corpse and once again promises to avenge them. Komonohashi pretends to be Toraj's fan, but Totomaro wishes he would just get serious. Komonohashi then rudely asks Toraj how he murdered the guy, and he simply says that he did it with his psychic powers. Everyone is shocked that he would openly admit to murder, but he points out that he can't be held responsible under the current laws. Totomaro confirms this as he can't arrest someone for a psychically induced death, and Komonohashi just continues his act as a superfan. He asks Toraj for an autograph and tells him to just use the pen he used in the demonstration. Toraj signs the tiny book, but the ink is so thick Komonohashi can barely read it. As Toraj leaves, he blames the neurosurgeon for everything. He says that if she had just believed in his psychic powers, then the death demonstration wouldn't have been necessary. He thinks that if anyone should be punished, it should be her. The guys go to check on her and a girl named Shikata introduces herself as Mofu's assistant at the hospital. Totomaro doesn't think it was her fault, but Mofu explains that she is a practitioner of medicine and she takes full responsibility for allowing someone to die right in front of her. Komonohashi asks her if this incident made her believe in psychic powers, but she isn't sure. What she is certain of though is that the man died because of poison. Her examination reveals that it was some kind of neurotoxin like blowfish poison or snake venom. Komonohashi already deduced this as well, referring to a speck on the back of the victim's neck as it might be a mark left by a poison needle. She wonders if Komonohashi is a doctor, but is heartbroken when he reveals that he is a Toraj superfan. Totomaro wonders if Toraj could have used some sort of blow dart to insert the needle, but she rejects that idea. She watched Toraj closely and he didn't do anything suspicious. On top of that, no one was standing behind the victim either. She freaks out as her brain can't explain what happened, and Totomaro actually begins to wonder if it was psychic powers. Komonohashi refuses to break character as he celebrates Toraj's victory, but Shikata explains that Mofu has a personal reason for not being able to lose. This reason is why Mofu rushed there right after surgery and why she even participated in such a crazy show in the first place. Komonohashi doesn't even need to hear the reason and just determines that it's even more of a reason to solve this absurd case. He vows that they will figure out the trick and see the fake psychic off the stage. Everyone is shocked as he removes his disguise and he reveals that it obviously wasn't psychic power. He shockingly reveals that he was really just a bandwagon fan all along and the only thing he is a true fan of is the truth. He points out that just after the subject saw the cue card, he closed his eyes and collapsed. However, he wonders if something happened after. Mofu reveals that while she was giving him CPR afterwards, the subject came to for just a moment. He was in distress and then his breathing stopped again. Totomaro is certain that Toraj couldn't have inserted any needles during the CPR and explains that forensics haven't found any needles. Totomaro is becoming more certain that it was psychic powers, but Komonhashi says they already have all the clues they need. Mofu notices that his eyes are pretty messed up and gives him some eye drops. Totomaro then gathers everyone and shockingly reveals that he's ready to solve the mystery. He has them reenact the entire scene. Mofu as the victim and himself as Toraj. For accuracy, Totomaro uses the same cue cards and he asks Toraj for his pen. Toraj resists and wonders why he should even participate in such a spectacle. Mofu is furious as she points out that someone just lost their life and asks him nicely for the pen. Unfortunately, she is super clumsy and trips over a cord. Toraj's pens fall on the floor so she takes it and apologizes as they're going to use it no matter what. They prepare and Toto explains that he will write on the card and Mofu will pretend to do what it says just like the plant did. Toraj objects to him calling the guy a plant and points out that no one would be willing to take their own life for a trick. Totomaro starts with the word jump so Mofu gets to jumping. He writes the word run so she runs. People watching are getting upset since she is just doing it because he told her to and they wonder if the detective is just wasting everyone's time. Totomaro then shows her the word death and everyone freaks out when Mofu collapses to the ground. Toto calms all these dummies down and explains that she isn't dead. He reveals that when Toraj showed the card to the subject, he actually turned the card upside down. When the word death is turned upside down, it spells sleep, so the man was actually still conscious when he collapsed and was just pretending to sleep. 
The headphones kept him from hearing the commotion, so he kept up the act even as Toraj took his pulse. This means that Toraj injected the man during the commotion and when the broadcast stopped airing. Mofu is shocked since this means the poison was just starting to take effect when she was giving him CPR. Tonomaru reiterates that no psychic powers were used and he directly confronts Toraj. Toraj is furious and points out that they haven't found a poison needle, but Totomaru shockingly reveals that they have. He explains that the reason why Toraj used his thick pen to sign his signature in such a tiny book was because he had the poison needle hidden in his thinner pen. Everyone is shocked but Toraj insists that he really does have psychic powers and plans to prove it to everyone. He loudly says the words Toraj psychic powers but nothing happens. Finally, he just admits to lying and gives up. He then goes on a tirade revealing that the subject was beginning to threaten him. The subject was going to spill the beans on their fake trick unless Toraj gave him 90% of the earnings so ending his life was his only choice. Just then, Kamonahashi tosses Toraj the poison pen and shockingly tells him to take his own life. This is because anyone who dismisses the lives of others has no right to live. He tells Toraj to stab himself and Toramaru instantly realizes that Kamonohashi is doing that thing again where he forces someone to end themselves. Our hero springs into action to knock the pen away but everyone is horrified when they see that Totomaru was stabbed in the hand. Kamonohashi comes back to his senses but is concerned for Toto. Mofu rushes to help him but it's too late, he has the mark of the poison needle. Something isn't right though and Toraj explains that he swapped the pen tip with the needle so there's no way that it could have left a mark. That means that he didn't have the right pen in his hand and luckily the poison pen was just one of the other ones on the ground. Afterwards, Totomaru explains that he really thought he was dead and Komonohashi apologizes for what he did. Totomaru doesn't really believe him and is certain that Komonohashi will be ready to investigate the next case. Something is different this time as Komonohashi doesn't make a smart comment as usual and he simply says that it was a mistake for him to start investigating crimes again. If things had ended differently just then, there would have been no way to undo it so Komonohashi thinks that he has no right to be a detective. It's clear that Komonohashi is really down on himself and Totomaru wonders if it's time that they give up on this really dangerous approach. Just then, Totomaru hears Mofu call for help and finds that the clumsy girl has her bandages caught on something. When freed, she thanks Totomaru for solving the case and reveals the reason why it was so important for her to win. In the past, she had several patients that believed in psychic powers way too much and would refuse surgery because of it. Now that they have disproved psychic powers just a bit, thanks to his brilliant deductions, it will save a lot of lives. These words completely re-energize our protagonist so he thanks her back and apologizes for Komonohashi scaring everyone at the end. He explains that Komonohashi has a weird habit of pressuring murderers into doing things and the neurosurgeon seems interested. When he leaves though, she thinks about how what Komonohashi did was definitely more than pressuring. Afterwards, our re-energized protagonist finds Komonohashi and tells him that he can't just quit after something like that. Komonohashi is quick to point out that he almost got Toto killed, but Toto reminds him that it was just an accident. Komonohashi can't accept that though and explains that if that happened again with the worst outcome then he wouldn't be able to live with himself. Toto is certain that he will stop Komonohashi next time and he tells him that he should have some faith in himself as well. Toto really has his attention now and points out how much Komonohashi loves investigating. He likes helping people and people's lives are at the core of everything he does. Toto seems to have gotten through to him and he shows Komonohashi an invitation that he got earlier that day. Toto doesn't know the person who sent it very well but it's for a gathering at an observatory on a remote island to watch a meteor shower. Totomaro thinks they need a change of pace and Komonohashi agrees that it could be a good idea to get away from mysteries for a while. On top of that, this remote island is actually famous for its black sugar syrup and Totomaro can't believe that it's the real reason why Komonohashi has agreed to go. Sometime later, we see that Komonohashi and Totomaru are on their way to the remote island. The guy who invited them says that he has a friend in some police department and Kawasemi told them that Totomaru is one of the best detectives around right now. Komonohashi wonders why a top detective would be invited to a meteor shower viewing party and the man explains that it's so they can be prepared for anything. The man mentions an incident that occurred on the island prompting Komonohashi to ask for more details. He instantly stops himself though since he is there to relax and get away from cases. Komonohashi struggles to keep himself from asking more questions so Toto just says that he is a bit tired. The man isn't too worried since he just asked him to come as insurance and he is confident that nothing bad will happen. They finally reach the island and the man explains that farmers will come from the main island during harvest season to pick sugarcane. However, it isn't harvest season yet so it's just the observatory staff and the guests staying there. Komonohashi still has questions but this time it's about his precious black sugar syrup. 
The man confirms that it's made from the sugar cane there, so Komonohashi signs up for three meals a day of the highest quality black sugar syrup. Our boy Komonohashi is really in vacation mode as he also states that he would like to try hula hooping after eating. Strangely enough, hula hooping at an observatory is on the list he made during his five year seclusion. They arrive at the observatory and are instantly curious about a gun on display in the lobby. The man explains that it's a replica that is supposed to ward off evil spirits. The guys are impressed since it's indistinguishable from the real thing, but are curious about the evil spirits. Long ago, in order to protect the sugar cane, residents kept a flintlock as a charm. The guys walk past all the guest rooms on the second floor to the observatory room where they find a really angry chef named Duno. With the dome closed, the place is soundproof, so she was just relieving some stress. When something really sets this lady off, she goes there to scream real loud. She complains about how some guest named Donzawa was really angry about how the stars weren't correctly positioned on his coffee cup. Even worse than that though, there's some guy requesting an entire meal of black sugar syrup. Komonohashi points out that it's for him, so she apologizes, and things get pretty awkward. The awkwardness is ended when Totomaru is shocked to see what Donzawa's hair looks like. This guy is super weird as he explains that his haircut was scientifically designed so as not to get in the way when he looks through a telescope. Dandawa calls them impure guests, which means they are people who can't appreciate the shower. People who aren't astronomy fans. Some photographer lady is there as well, and she introduces herself as Onodera. It's pointed out that there is another non-astronomy lover guest among them, and Komonohashi surprisingly calls this guy his sensei. He is the Blue Detective Academy's closed circle theory instructor named John Grizzly. John is one of the very few instructors that Komonohashi recognizes as his superior. John wants to know why Komonohashi is there and he simply says that he is there on a gourmet journey. The man that invited them there is named Jumanji and he explains to everyone that he invited Totomaro and John there to make sure there is no trouble. Komonohashi thinks it's pretty strange to invite renowned detectives there, but Onodera explains that it's the least he can do after the gut-wrenching incident that happened there. Komonohashi desperately tries to tell her that he isn't interested, but Totomaru's quick to point out that his actions and words aren't matching. This is because Komonohashi is holding his hand to his ear like he's trying to listen for more. Komonohashi then acts like Totomaru's the one that wants to hear more details so she can continue explaining. John reveals that 10 years ago, the director at the time and six others were gunned down. Jumanji reveals that the one that died 10 years ago was his father. The gun used was never found and the killer remains unidentified. They considered shutting down the observatory, but Jumanji's father loved the place with all his heart. He is certain that overcoming that tragedy is what his father would want, so that is why he is hosting the viewing party for the same meteor shower. Everyone encourages him, but some random blue-haired chick pretends she has a tear in her eye after hearing his story. Her name is Orihime, and she introduces herself as the idol of the constellation Orion. Just then, the director is shocked as the dome begins to open without permission. Komonohashi just couldn't help himself, and the director explains that the telescope automatically tracks the position and records footage of any stars entered. They won't be using it to observe the shower though, since just using the naked eye captures the beauty of the shower the best. The meteor shower doesn't start till 11pm, so everyone is welcome to enjoy the buffet until then. Moments later, Totomaro finds that Komonohashi has already seated himself and is shocked to see that he has covered everything in black sugar syrup. The guy with the silly haircut explains that Komonohashi has charmed them all since he is a pure astronomy maniac. Komonohashi explains that he learned about astronomy a while ago and Totomaro just now realizes that he doesn't know much about his secret detective partner. Toto then wonders if John knows about Komonohashi's illness and if he might have a hint about how to cure it. Totomaru approaches him, and John surprisingly asks him if Komonohashi has been doing any investigating. Totomaru lies right through his teeth by saying no, and explains that he knows that Komonohashi ends up pressuring the perpetrators. Toto doesn't know the details though, so he asks John to tell him if Komonohashi really pressured culprits to their own deaths. John begins by saying that 5 years ago, Komonohashi took part in a hands-on training exercise. Komonohashi amazingly succeeded in locating the base of a group of 7 killers. But when police entered the stronghold, they only found Komonohashi standing there, dazed and covered in blood. Murder weapon in hand among the corpses of all seven murderers. It became known as the bloody training incident. There's a 99% certainty that Komonohashi did it, but he had no memory of what happened 30 minutes before or after that. For this reason, he was considered to be of unsound mind at that time. As such, barring him of his detective license was the extent of his punishment. However, this intense guy says that Komonohashi is lucky. 
because if he had been in charge of deciding Komonahashi's fate, then he would have given him the death penalty. Just then, Orihime frantically tells Totomaro to stop Komonahashi. Toto goes to check what the extremely urgent matter is, but finds that it's just a very stuffed Komonahashi trying to keep himself from puking while hula hooping. Komonahashi explains that he was really just demonstrating the orbit of planets in a solar system. He is happy to have achieved his goal, but is tired and heads to bed. He decides that he can just see the meteor shower in his dreams, and his new diehard fans admire the deep thought. A while later, the meteor shower begins, but Totomaro notices that Onodera isn't there. She apparently went to get photography equipment, but it's been two hours since she left. The dome begins to open for some reason, and everyone rushes off when they hear a gunshot. The door to the telescope is locked, so the director runs to get the key. John desperately tries to ask if anyone is in there, and the director returns as he wasn't able to find the key. They break down the door to find that it's pitch black and the lights don't work. Uno brings them some flashlights and they shockingly find that Onodera and Komonahashi are both on the floor. Thankfully, Komonahashi is still breathing, but unfortunately, Onodera is no longer alive. John is furious at himself since he should have predicted this, but Totomaro hopes that he doesn't think Komonahashi is responsible. The others point out how it was obviously Komonahashi since the gun is right next to him. The chef suspects him as well since only a psycho would order so much black sugar syrup. Komonahashi then shockingly speaks as he defends his favorite food by saying that black sugar syrup did nothing wrong. He explains that he woke up to Orihime screaming. He doesn't remember anything after going back to his room and lying down on his bed. However, he can deduce from their conversation that he is in a very bad situation right now. Everyone wants him to be arrested, but John silences everyone and points out that they are all suspects too. John looks at every incident fairly, so Komonohashi points out that he is truly an instructor who embodies Blue's lofty ideals. Komonohashi asks John and the renowned police detective Totomaro to investigate this case thoroughly. Toto remembers that he has to investigate too, and John tells Komonohashi to remain quiet and watch. John points out that the body is still warm, which means she was only very recently deceased. The bullet struck her heart directly through the back. An autopsy will confirm everything, but it's safe to say that the gunshot was the cause of death and the gun was the murder weapon. The gun was the one on display in the lobby, but the director never could have imagined that it was real. The lights in there are strangely all broken. There is also no ladder, so escape through the dome would be impossible. There are no other exits, which means that no one else could have done it other than Komonahashi. There is undeniable evidence against him, which is the same as five years ago. There is no other way in or out of the room, but the door was locked. So inside the observation dome was a perfect locked room. Komonohashi can't believe that the locked door makes him the culprit, but he then shockingly finds the key in his pocket. It's the only master key they have, but Komonohashi has no clue why it would be in his pocket. Everyone is certain that he is the culprit, but Totomaro points out that Komonohashi has no reason to hurt anyone. John has made his decision though, and tells Totomaro to arrest Komonohashi. Totomaro begins to refuse, but Komonohashi is okay with it, as long as Toto is the one arresting him. Toto wants him to defend himself, but Komonohashi has nothing to say. John has Totomaro bring Komonohashi his shoes, as walking through all the broken glass would be dangerous. John has the director call the police on the main island, as a proper investigation is still necessary. Everyone thinks that the place is cursed, but Jumanji's just glad that they found the culprit, and he thanks John. Totomaro handcuffs Komonohashi in another room, and Komonohashi explains that his memory stops at collapsing onto his bed. When he opened his eyes, he was already in the observatory dome along with Onodera, who he apparently ended. Totomaro wonders if it was the same feeling from the bloody training incident, and he says that it is exactly the same. Komonohashi has really started to believe that he is the murderer, since he can't remember anything. Totomaro gets furious as this isn't like the Komonohashi he knows, but Komonohashi points out that Totomaro doesn't have any proof of his innocence. Totomaro counters this by saying that the victim was just an ordinary person, and the only people that Komonohashi has tried to pressure to death have always been murderers. Komonohashi is shocked, and Toto further proves his point by saying that he has never once tried to end the life of an innocent person. Totomaro then proclaims that even if Komonohashi isn't sure about his innocence, he is sure about it. Komonohashi snaps out of it and says that Toto's words have warmed up his frozen brain just a little. He says that he just remembered something, and reveals that he has been keeping a secret from Toto. This secret is that he is completely useless with a gun. He always earned perfect scores in every other subject, but not marksmanship. He failed for never being able to do so much as graze a target. Onodera was shot directly in the heart, but Komonohashi says that even if he had a thousand tries, he wouldn't have been able to land a single shot. Toto is shocked and wonders why he didn't mention this before. 
Komonohashi explains that ever since the incident five years ago, he always told himself something. If anything like that ever happened again, he would just give up without a fight, no matter how hard it was to accept. He resented everyone after that day, so it was the only way he could keep himself sane. Komonohashi thanks Toro for helping him snap out of it, and explains that his brain is not working at 1%. Totomaro realizes that if Komonohashi isn't the real culprit, then someone framed him. The person is still out there, so he rushes off to investigate. Komonohashi remembers that he cried and screamed when he was arrested five years ago, and wonders why he isn't now. However, he realizes why he isn't panicking this time, and that's because he now has Toto. Heavy rain pours outside, and Jumanji almost has a heart attack when he finds out that police won't arrive until the next morning or even later. Totomaru returns to the crime scene and shockingly discovers that all the lights in the room were shot out with a gun. They were all hit dead center, so it definitely couldn't have been Komonohashi since he is no marksman. Several bullets were fired, but they strangely only heard one from outside the dome. Toto tries out chatting it up with the corpse like Komonohashi does, but he just ends up freaking out. He then remembers that the telescope automatically makes recordings of stars, and he wonders if it recorded any clues. Totomaru checks the computer, but it started when someone sneaks up behind him. It turns out to just be John, who thought Toto was an intruder. John is looking for more evidence against Komonohashi, since he wants to make sure that he gets the death sentence this time. John reveals that he has already interviewed everyone, and Totomaru realizes that this old tough dude is way ahead of him. Everyone says that Onodera was last seen at 11pm, and she went back to her room for photography equipment. However, John thinks that it was odd that she wasn't prepared already, considering the weather was supposed to be bad later that night. The shot heard at 1am was definitely the one that sent her to the afterlife, but everyone has an alibi. Jumanji was hanging out in his office for a short time at 11.30, but returned to the roof by midnight. Donzawa was on the roof the entire time, besides one trip to the restroom at midnight. Uno the chef was in the kitchen from 11pm to 1am. When the gunshot was heard, she was talking to Orihime, who had gone to get drinks. Orihime is some kind of e-girl, so she started live streaming to all her simps at midnight, and when it ended at around 12.40, she went to the kitchen. She and Uno were together when everyone freaked out about the gunshot. Toto was on the roof, so the only person without an alibi is Komonohashi. Totomaru is certain that Komonohashi is innocent, but John points out that he is not being logical. Toto quickly points out though that he is not the logical one, and that is Komonohashi's field. John has never heard anyone speak about Komonohashi the way he does, and Totomaru says that it's because they are truly friends. John is amazed since this means that Komonohashi has changed a lot. He used to never let anyone get close, but he now has a friend that trusts him against all logic. Toto then shows him the bullet holes and what he found on the computer. A recording started at 11pm, but it was completely black until 1am. From then, it only recorded the North Star. Toto thinks it's irrelevant, but John realizes something and gets really upset at himself for not noticing sooner. He gives Toto the key to free Komonohashi and instructs him to tell Komonohashi everything. Komonohashi definitely isn't the culprit, but there's no time to jump for joy as they have to catch the real criminal as soon as possible. John urges him to be careful though, since no backup is coming. Police are being held back by a typhoon, and John fears that more killings will happen. Toto frees Komonohashi and catches him up on everything. Komonohashi reveals what John figured out and points out that shooting multiple lights in a darkened dome is impossible. This means that the lights must have been shot either before 11pm or after 1am. There were 7 lights but only one shot was heard at 1pm, so all the other lights must have been shot before 11pm. This means that glass was all over the floor before 11. Komonohashi was found barefoot, so if he walked in there in the darkness, his feet would have been covered in blood and cuts. He couldn't have moved even a single step from where his body was found, but there was a giant telescope between him and the victim's body. From that position, he wouldn't have been able to shoot her. Komonohashi is reinvigorated and is ready for the fun part. He reveals that the extreme sleepiness he felt after dinner was actually due to sleeping medication that was put in his black sugar syrup meal. Totomaro foolishly assumes that it was the chef, but the brilliant detective points out that everyone had plenty of opportunities to drug his meal. Komonohashi wants to put solving the crime aside for a moment so he can enjoy some fun time. Toto has no clue what he is talking about, so a genius protagonist reveals his plan to drink some syrup that doesn't actually have sleeping medicine in it. John racks his brain trying to figure out the real culprit and discovers a piece of fishing line. Komonohashi dives into his secret stash of black sugar syrup and credits it for powering his brain to 100%. Komonohashi thought they might find a clue of whoever dragged him out of bed while unconscious, but everything has been completely wiped down. 
This only makes him realize that the crime was prepared very carefully. It wasn't a crime of opportunity and Komonohashi must have been targeted for framing early on. Toto explains that John was planning to apologize the next time he saw Komonohashi, and Komonohashi explains that this is exactly why he respects John so much. Toto thinks that John is actually a really good guy too, and reveals that John wants to reinvestigate Komonohashi's blood training incident. Syrup goes flying everywhere as Komonohashi can't hold in his excitement, and he can't wait to thank John. The fun ends very soon though, as a gunshot is heard and John's body falls outside their window. John lies outside alone and exclaims that it's a trap for Komonohashi. Komonohashi arrives soon after, but it's too late, John is gone. Totomaru is stunned and Komonohashi emphasizes how serious the situation is since John was an instructor at Blue. Blue is the world's foremost detective agency, so for one of its instructors to meet their demise, their opponent must be very formidable. Komonohashi makes his promise to avenge his sensei and Totomaru vows to help him. Our genius protagonist then begins his 300 IQ deducing. John's clothing shows no sign of a struggle, so he was shot from a distance. Either that or he was cut off guard. Komonohashi notices the fishing line and others arrive to the scene. They instantly assume Komonohashi did it since he's supposed to be handcuffed, but Toto jumps to his defense. Komonohashi takes care of it though and explains everything really quickly. The same gun that was used on Onodera was found on the roof and it seems like the culprit took it from John who confiscated it. Everyone is terrified and Totomaru goes over everyone's alibi. Jumanji was resting in his office and Donzawa just finished up important business in the bathroom. Uno was asleep with earplugs and Orihima was using earphones to check the sound of her livestream to her desperate simps. This unfortunately means that no one has a good alibi and anyone could have put the bullet into John. Everyone is frightened as someone among them is the cold-blooded life ender. The police won't be showing up anytime soon, so Donzawa fears that the tragedy from 10 years ago will repeat itself. He thinks that the island really is cursed and freaks everyone out when he exclaims that they're all going to be found as corpses. Komonohashi calms everyone down as he proclaims that that won't happen. He says that while Tadamaro might not look it, he is actually really enraged. Komonohashi seems to be talking about himself but tells everyone that Tadamaro loves mysteries more than anyone and he's good at solving them. Unfortunately, he fell into a trap and now two people have lost their lives right in front of him. One of those people he respected a lot. Komonohashi explains that the culprit is there hiding behind a mask and smiling with triumph. This person will regret their actions soon, however, as they have enraged someone that they never should have. Toto and Komonohashi reinvestigate the first crime and Toto demonstrates how they got through the door. Komonohashi seems to realize something but asks Toto how he thinks the culprit managed to turn the dome into a locked room. The master key was in Komonohashi's pocket and he was locked inside. Tomorrow thinks that the culprit must have used some kind of tool and remembers the fishing line. He assumes that they must have used it by running it down from the gap at the top of the door, attaching it to the key and turning it from the outside. Totomaru is pretty proud of himself but Komonohashi tells him he is wrong. Toto thought that he finally made his first deduction but Komonohashi points him toward the door's edges. Toto is shocked when he realizes that the fishing line couldn't go through any gaps because there is adhesive on the side of the door. There is enough on there that not even the thinnest fishing line could fit through it. Totomaru can't understand why someone would lock and glue it so Komonohashi reiterates that their adversary is truly formidable. This just makes them even more worth defeating and Toto can't believe how happy Komonohashi looks. Toto keeps explaining what happened after that but Komonohashi has already moved on to the corpse. From her location the only thing she could see was a vent but no one could have entered or exited through there. Komonohashi has Toto turn off all the lights and Toto takes a second to let his eyes adjust. Totomaru realizes that Onodera collapsed in front of the switch to open the dome. The dome opened right before they heard the shot so she must have hit the switch and got eliminated right after that. Just when it seemed like he was deducing his way to victory, Totomaru loses it. Everyone has an alibi for Onodera's shooting. The dome was completely locked so no one could have ended her in there. Toto gets really serious as he fears that even Komonohashi might not be able to solve this case. However, he turns on the light to find that our boy is challenging himself to see if he can hula hoop in the dark. Toto assumes that he has given up but Komonohashi shows him that the fishing line got caught in his hula hoop. Toto panics as it's an important clue but Komonohashi explains that what he has done is an important key to solving the mystery. Toto is completely lost but Komonohashi reveals that he has already solved the case and all that's left to do now is to find the culprit. Toto catches a stray hula hoop to the face and Orihime arrives as she was looking for Totomaru. 
She was worried that the typhoon would cause a power outage and she wouldn't be able to get Sims to give her more money. Orihime asks for a flashlight and explains that she already asked Uno. Uno apparently was really upset since everyone was making her take flashlights all over the place. Komonahashi realizes something about the flashlights and compliments Orihime for giving them the last piece of the puzzle. Komonahashi explains that it's Totomaro's turn now and it's time for them to launch their counterattack. A while later, Totomaro gathers everyone so that they can arrest the murderer as quickly as possible. Everyone is stunned since this means that he has solved the case, but they all thought he was a stupid idiot. Our protagonist strikes fear in all those that doubted him by explaining that the culprit is in this very room. He starts his explanation with John's unfortunate end. Toto explains that he and Komonahashi both saw John fall outside their window. If they didn't see him, then they would have went straight to the roof because that's where the gunshot was heard. Strangely though, someone else came to the street as well. Not only that, but this careful murderer didn't bring an umbrella. The reason being so they could hide the fact that they got wet on the roof when committing the murder. Toto then stuns everyone when he reveals that the culprit is Jumanji. This dummy has just been caught but tries to say that he would never do such a thing. He gives the typical excuse of saying that he accidentally thought the gunshot came from the street but no one is stupid enough to believe him. His next offense is that he was with Totomaro when Onodera was shot, but Totomaro has shockingly already solved that case as well. Toto explains that Jumanji only pretended to be in his office watching handicap videos. What he really did was use some sleep medication to knock Onodera out and dragged her to the dome. He already shot the lights out earlier and put Komonohashi on the ground after using the same nighttime medicine on him. Jumanji slipped the keys in our boy's pocket and put some finishing touches on the doors with some flex seal super glue. The stupid lunch lady questions our boy's brilliance since she clearly remembers that the doors were locked from the inside. Totomaro explains that this was the most brilliant part of the deranged killer's plan. Jumanji gave Onodera a lighter dose of the sleepy medicine, so she woke up and went looking for the light switch because it was pitch black in there. The lights were all broken thanks to the genius criminal, so she went looking for the exit. Unfortunately for her, the doors were glued shut, but she didn't know that and tried to unlock them. She turned the key, but what she was actually doing was locking the doors. The others finally begin to believe the brilliant detective, but the guy with the mushroom haircut is freaking out. The door locking explanation is solid, but he wants to play backseat detective and he points out that Onodera was shot in that locked room. He wonders how someone could have shot her at that point and who did it. Totomaro has it all figured out and explains that the evildoer anticipated Onodera's next move after locking the door. Everything became clear after finding the fishing line that was left as a clue by John who is now solving crimes in heaven. Jumanji tied one end of the string to the top of the telescope and the other end to the trigger of a gun hidden and secured inside the air vent. The only thing that was illuminated in the room other than the light switch was the switch to open the dome. Onodera thought she was being smart since opening the ceiling would bring in starlight and she could call for help. Unfortunately, she is dumb and what actually happened is that the telescope moved to record a star it was programmed to follow. The telescope pulled on the string and the string pulled on the trigger. The gun was aimed perfectly and she was shot. The stupid Jumanji refuses to give up and points out that the gun was found next to Komonohashi, not in the air vent. Toto reminds them that the gun they found was the one from the lobby, but the real gun was taken from the vent when everyone entered the dome and was distracted by Onodera's dumb lifeless body. Jumanji's life ending spree didn't end there as he used the same gun to finish off John. Jumanji seems to really lose his mind at this point and questions why anyone would think he would commit these crimes. He demands answers but our boy Toto won't be pushed around and reminds this future prisoner that he's the one asking the questions. Toto points out that before they even open the doors to the dome, Jumanji told the lunch lady to get them flashlights. However, the only person that could have known the lights were out was the person that shot them. This stubborn idiot finally breaks and admits that he has lost. Jumanji doesn't regret what he did and the psycho even doubles down by saying that Onodera deserved it. Jumanji then reveals her secret. She wasn't really a photographer, Onodera was actually a journalist who specializes in unsolved cases and she was snooping around looking for clues on what happened 10 years ago. Jumanji realized it immediately. The night of the shower, Onodera went to rummage through his room so the psycho had to take care of her. Komonohashi finally says something and shocks the guy when he points out that this must mean Jumanji has a dark secret from 10 years ago. Komonohashi is right as Jumanji is just spilling all the beans at this point and reveals that he hid the same gun from 10 years ago in his room. On that day, his father used the gun to eliminate all the guests and staff, then himself. 
Jumaji was the first to see the massacre and he knew he had to hide it all because of the shame it would bring. Jumanji just wanted to live the rest of his life in peace and for some reason thought he could do that by committing cold-blooded murder. Jumanji wishes that John would have just blamed Komonohashi for everything, but he didn't so he had to send him to the afterlife too. Just then, we see that Komonohashi has gone unconscious again and demands that Jumanji console the dead with his own death. His eyes do that mind control thing, but Totomaru jumps in to stop the rogue justice from happening. Komonohashi comes back to his senses, but Jumanji is a complete lunatic. He refuses to let Komonohashi take his life and plans to handle it himself by ingesting a pill. Komonohashi knows that it's some kind of self-life ending pill and tries to get Jumanji to spit it out. Komonohashi's sad attempt at the Heimlich maneuver doesn't work but he tells Jumanji that he still has a ton of questions he wants to ask him. He wants to know why he was chosen to be framed and why he was chosen to come to the island in the first place. Jumanji reveals that Komonohashi was of course part of the plan from the beginning. He eerily says that no matter how much Komonohashi struggles, he is still dancing in a certain person's palm. Komonohashi demands to know who the person is, but this guy just says the words, night turns to dawn, and catapults his worthless life right out of his stupid body. Komonohashi demands answers, but he isn't getting any more confessions out of a corpse, no matter how good of an interrogator he is. The next morning, everyone is relieved to hear that the police will finally be coming, and they only had to wait till three people died. Komonohashi is still upset though. He was part of Jumanji's plan from the start and the jerk used his pure and innocent love of black sugar syrup to lure him there. Jumanji even framed him in front of a blue instructor and trapped him. Komonohashi questions who Jumanji could be and if he's just someone else's lackey then who is this other person? Just then Komonohashi recalls the corpse's final words night turns to dawn. It just so happens to be dawn now so Komonohashi opens the ceiling. Komonohashi seems to discover something by doing this, but Totomaro interrupts with the police. One of these late to the party cops seems to notice something and is surprised by his superior. Nearby, Toto finishes up asking Orihime some questions. She compliments him on being a star detective and this delusional girl blasts out of there with her comet dash. Afterwards, Toto explains that all the bodies were retrieved and the police boat has departed. Komonohashi explains that he has huge regrets and never would have believed that John would be leaving in a body bag. He reminds Totomaro about how he said he would stop investigating from now on but takes it all back. The fact that this incident resembles his past so closely is no coincidence. Just like in the bloody training incident, Komonohashi woke up at the scene of the crime with no memory of it. That's not the only similarity though. Komonohashi reveals a picture he took of Onodera's body with morning light shining in. The picture is startling as a mark around her corpse is in the same exact shape as the scar on Komonohashi's neck. He couldn't see it when it was dark but it's very clear that it was drawn with red ink before she was shot. Komonohashi somehow never realized it before but all the clues point to the same thing. Nothing like the bloody training incident happened before or ever since. He only started pressuring criminals to take their own lives after that day and it's also when his scar appeared. All this points to him being framed for the bloody training incident. Komonohashi has devoted his life to deduction and the person pulling the strings stole 5 years of investigation from him. This mysterious person grew tired of waiting for him to realize it in his grief so they come up with a crime that had several elements from 5 years ago and invited Komonohashi to it. It's almost as if this person is declaring that they are way more intelligent than he is. It's like they're laughing because they're holding his life as a detective in their hands. Komonohashi can't stand it since it's like this person is playing games and it's the greatest humiliation of Komonohashi's life. Worst of all, they used his precious black sugar syrup against him, so he vows to never forgive this person. Aboard the police boat, one cop is alone and Jumanji shockingly emerges from his body bag. He is relieved that he just managed to escape death and credits the cop with helping him. Jumanji had no clue that he would be able to fake his own death the way he did and once again credits the cop. The cop applauds him on behalf of a certain family and Jumanji's ready to begin his new life. Onodera was close to discovering the truth but this family contacted Jumanji just in time. This family is called the legendary house of M, the pinnacle of the criminal underworld. It's said that all crimes pass through the house of M and any crimes they commit are guaranteed to go unsolved. They are the greatest family in the history of crime and Jumanji can't believe that one of them is standing before him. The cop is humble about all the praise and just wants to know how Komonohashi behaved. Jumanji explains that once Komonohashi figured out he was the culprit, his personality completely changed just like the family said it would. 
Jumanji gets frantic and explains that if he didn't fake his own death, then Komonahashi definitely would have forced him to. Jumanji continues his praise, but the cop has all the information he needs and puts a bullet through his head. The cop removes his super realistic mask and tells his brother that the job is finished. The blonde boy explains that he saw Komonahashi for the first time, but he is not like anyone in their family. The boy explains that when Komonahashi saw the mark that matched his scar, he turned pale. It's clear that he doesn't know what it means, so the brother explains that one day, Komonahashi will come to appreciate the blood that floats in him from their side of the family. The man then reveals the biggest secret. The ultimate detective, Sherlock Holmes, and the master of crime, James Moriarty. Komonahashi possesses the blood of them both. Back on the island, we see that the descendant of these two brilliant people is hula hooping. Komonahashi isn't depressed anymore and now feels like having a mystery attached to him is kind of interesting. More importantly though, Komonohashi asks Toto if he will continue helping him. The two are good friends now so Totomaru agrees as he doesn't want to see anything bad happen to him. On a brighter note, Komonohashi explains that the chef gave him the rest of the black sugar syrup. Totomaru doesn't want any, but Komonohashi reveals that he has plenty to share with him. Some time later, our detectives return home, and Totomaru is surprised to see that Komonohashi airs out his floor of laziness. Totomaru thinks about pointing out how Komonohashi seems a bit weird since returning from the observatory, but quickly remembers that he has always been a little weird. The boat carrying the observatory murderer sank, the crew is missing, and Komonohashi doesn't think it was an accident. Totomaru thinks he's just being crazy, but Komonohashi can't think of any other explanation. He is certain that the person that gave him his scar also sank the boat. Totomaru starts to believe him and wonders how the crazy detective can be so calm. Running around panicking doesn't help anything, so Komonohashi plans to take appropriate measures while still enjoying his life. Totomaru then finds Komonohashi's seemingly lifeless cat under his floor of laziness, and Komonohashi reveals that he brought a souvenir for Amamaya. Totomaru gives her the gift, but she completely ignores it as she has a job for him. She doesn't give him any details though, and Totomaru meets a reporter named Mankai. She normally covers actors and athletes, but today she will be shadowing Totomaru. Her column is all about people of interest, and Totomaru fits perfectly after solving such high-profile crimes. His name was never in any papers, so Totomaru wonders how she could know that he solved them. It turns out that Mankai might be a bit of a stalker, as she reveals that she is completely enamored. She was kidnapped as a child, and the man that valiantly saved her was a police detective. Ever since then, detectives have been heroes in her eyes. That's why she became a reporter and even tries to investigate unsolved cases and impossible crimes in her own way. She has been paying close attention to Totomaro and how he has unraveled crime after crime. He is like a hero to her and this crazy lady even goes as far as to call him a god. Totomaro knows that Komonohashi deserves all the credit but he doesn't want to expose him and put him in danger. Totomaro explains that he hasn't been assigned to anything right now but this chick fangirls super hard over him. She assumes the department is reserving him for the next big case, which she would expect since he is the ace detective of Division 1. Mankai follows our boy throughout the day, but he just wants to get it over with before she uncovers his secret. Totomaro has only been doing paperwork all day, so he suggests that they have an interview at a coffee shop. There, Toto is shocked to find that Komonohashi is working there, and he introduces himself as Komakyu. Komonohashi explains that they don't have black coffee there, and the only thing they have that is black is their black sugar syrup. Toto pulls his oddball friend to the side, where Komonohashi explains that he is there to lecture the owner on how to make his special black sugar syrup latte. Toto mocks him for having too much free time, but Komonohashi is quick to point out that it's only because Toto hasn't brought him any work. Komonohashi was able to deduce that Toto's friend was a reporter almost instantly. His genius brain was able to determine this because of her scuff shoes, all the cards in her phone case, and because the first thing she looked at was the magazine rack. Just then, Komonohashi has to get back to his fake job as a group of girls walk in. Two of them order some drinks while one of them takes a picture outside. Totomaru gets his drink first and Komonohashi hilariously explains that it isn't just black sugar syrup as it has some water in it. Toto can't actually believe that Komonohashi is really working there, but Komonohashi proves it as he makes the drinks for the girls. They are all impressed by his work, but Komonohashi gets offended when the girl thinks his drawing is of a duck when it's actually of his favorite animal, a platypus. Monkei takes a picture of the guys and explains that she's going to write an article about the cases Toto solved. 
Kamonahashi finally wasn't able to deduce something as he didn't realize that this girl was a crime reporter. Our crazy detective then gives them a sample size of their black sugar syrup latte, but it's clearly way too much for them. Toto pulls his friend aside to figure out what's going on. Kamonahashi explains that crime reporters are a great source of intel on hard cases, so he wants Toto to build a good relationship with her. Kamonahashi goes to glaze her up a bit, but Monkai can tell that he's making Totomaru uncomfortable. Kamonahashi can instantly tell that she admires Toto a great deal, which makes him like her. Just then, everyone is stunned as one of the girls from the earlier group collapses. Kamonohashi has Toto call the police as he determined that the girl was poisoned. The place quickly turns to a crime scene and police confirm that there was a cyanide capsule in the now deceased woman's cup. Kamonohashi makes his promise to avenge the corpse as usual, but Mankai gets upset. She explains that crime scenes are a great detective's battlefield and Totomaru is the best of the best. Monkai really glazes up our boy and Kamonohashi states that even a suspect like himself is glad that a detective as great as Totomaru is on the case. Him being a suspect surprises them, but he points out that only three people had a chance to put poison in the woman's coffee. Himself who made the drink and the two girls sitting with her. There aren't many clues, but Monkai assures everyone that Totomaru will solve the case. Monkai promises to do her best as a reporter to cover Totomaru during this process and explains that she has covered some very famous cases before. Komonohashi sees this as a great opportunity to get more complex cases and tells Monkai that she should call Totomaru from now on when she hears about a case, regardless of where it takes place. Totomaru then interviews the three suspects. Komonohashi explains that he simply made the latte and the only strange thing that happened was that the stupid girl mistook his platypus for a duck. The girl in green is Hayami and she was the one that brought the drinks. The victim named Julie took a picture of them and Hayami had to make a phone call to her boss. Julie went to take pictures around the cafe and when they both returned to the table, Julie drank the latte and died. Totomaru tells the others that he doesn't think that the waiter did it since he had no way of knowing who would drink which cup. He also doesn't see any motive he would have to kill at random. Of course, Mankai is amazed by her hero's deductions, but even Komonahashi can see growth in his friend's abilities. The girl dressed like a banana makes the case even stranger as she reveals that Julie, for some reason, didn't drink the cup right in front of her. She drank the one on the opposite side, so everyone wonders how the murderer could have gotten her to do that. Totomaru is done with his questions, but wonders if the culprit used some kind of trick. Komonohashi tells Toto that he dropped his phone, but he really just wanted to get his attention. Komonohashi wrote on the phone that he should check Julie's social media page and the pictures that Mankai took. Totomaru acts like the idea just popped into his head and Mankai scrambles to pull up her photos. Like a true creep, most of her pictures were of Totomaru, but she does have one picture of the lattes. This will be of great use and Komonohashi admires his amazing craftsmanship. Totomaru finds Julie's social media page and finds a picture of her holding the latte she drank. Nothing seems off about it, but Komonohashi seems to realize something. Totomaru doesn't realize anything though and racks his brain to figure something out. His struggling is pretty obvious and Monkai thinks about how she always thought that Totomaru solved cases more easily than this. Toto is pretty stressed out, so Komonohashi offers him a little refreshment. He calls it a hot hand towel, but it's more like a bath towel because it's so huge. Komonohashi points out that it has the cafe's amazing logo on it, but Toto would rather not stand out that way. Surprisingly, Komonohashi tells him that that's the key. He does that cool guy look thing he likes to do and states that when you pick the wrong way to stand out, you pick the wrong way in life too. Totomaru has seen this pose many times already and he knows that it means that they have solved the case. Monkai hears him say this and is amazed that Totomaru already knows who the perpetrator is. Toto goes with Komonohashi to discuss the conclusion, but he stops for a second. He rushes to Monkai and he asks her to hide anything in the kitchen with a blade on it. There is a chance there might be another murder, but he thinks about how the culprit is the one in danger this time because of Komonohashi. Toto is ready for the reveal and starts by explaining that the culprit knew that Julie would pick the drink in the back. Julie was at the center of all the pictures on her social media page as she shot things in a way that drew attention to herself. Knowing this, it was obvious which cup she would choose. The culprit flicked her finger across the unpoisoned lattes to make them less photogenic than the poison one. This happened in the brief time the drinks were being carried to the table and he has a photo as proof. Toto asks Hayami how only the eyes could be misshapen on the lattes and he proclaims that she's the only one that could have done it. 
Hayami breaks down and admits to everything. Julie always had to be at the center of attention and Hayami couldn't stand it anymore. Because of that, Julie even stole her boyfriend, but Toromaru must tell her that taking someone's life is never the right answer. Komonahashi has a different approach to teaching her a lesson and demands that Hayami bash her own head in. He is doing his mind control thing and once again demands that she bash her head in. Mankai can't understand what he is saying, but Hayami obeys his orders. She prepares to bash her face into a sharp point, but Tonomaru acts quickly to stop her with a bag of coffee beans. Komonohashi snaps back to normal and immediately thanks Toto for his help. Mankai is at a loss for words, but seems happy about her hero's actions. Totomaru apologizes to her for accidentally breaking her recorder, but she couldn't care less as she was able to see him in action. Thanks to him, she realized that a great detective doesn't solve cases like magic. They do it by earnestly tackling everything with all their strength. Her respect has grown even more for Toto, so she hopes they can work together in the future. Toto agrees and Komonohashi surprises them when he does as well. His lattes have a hidden message and it states how glad he is that they have acquired the reporter as a powerful ally. Komonohashi is always one to lighten the mood as he offers to order them some food. Toto points out that cafes don't usually do that, so Komonohashi tells Toto that he should treat Monkai to some of his home cooking. These guys are out of control, but Monkai seems amused by their antics. Sometime later, Mofu gives Komonohashi some test results. She reveals that his involuntary pressuring of perpetrators is not an inborn condition. Mofu can't figure out what is causing it and recommends that he have more tests done at a research facility. At the station, Amamaya informs Totomaru that he will be assisting another station. Kawasemi will be there as well, so she wants Totomaru to check on him even though she calls the guy trash. She explains that ever since Kawasemi lost his partner, crimes have been going unsolved more often. Totomaru remembers that they had some type of relationship, so he assumes that deep down, she must care about this guy. Amamaya proves him wrong, however, as she hopes that Kawasemi fails even more so she can become superintendent instead of him. On his way to the other station, Totomaru wonders why Komonohashi has decided to come along. Amamaya only sent Toto to confirm that Kawasemi is failing, so there isn't even a big case or anything. Komonohashi points out that a case could pop up since Kawasemi isn't doing well, but Toto assumes that Komonohashi is really worried about Kawasemi. Komonohashi wonders if this could be true and makes Totomaru laugh when he even starts investigating his own feelings. John once told Toto that Komonohashi never let anyone close to him, so Toto asks him if he has any friends. Komonohashi reveals that he doesn't have a single friend, but realizes that Toto is his friend. Toto is glad to hear it and thinks about how Komonohashi is really starting to change. When their train stops, Komonohashi surprisingly reveals that they will be splitting up as he has something to take care of. Totomaru learns that Kawasemi isn't at the station and finds him in the streets yelling at some guy for not being perfect like he tends to do. This guy has to tell Kawasemi to quiet down as he explains that he is undercover. The lead in the guy's operation is named Kimyu, but Kawasemi drops his tweezers and it becomes pretty clear to Totomaru that this guy isn't doing well at all. Kawasemi speaks with Toto, but he already knows that Amamaya sent him to see just how far he has fallen. Toto is shocked that he figured it out, so Kawasemi tells him to tell his boss that he is in the darkest depths of a slump. Kawasemi explains that the incident with his partner hasn't affected him that much, but the issue is that for some reason, he hasn't been able to see things the way he used to. Kawasemi accompanies Totomaro to get some souvenirs, and they find a sign warning people of the mad chameleon. A random attacker that in broad daylight has been hitting students with something that is like a wrench. The attacker takes the victim's cell phone and nothing else. Evidence reveals that it's the same culprit over and over again, but strangely their appearance is different every time. A true master of disguise, which is why he is called the Mad Chameleon. According to victim testimony, the culprit is a grade schooler with fox-like eyes, a large man close to 2 meters in height, and a slim, elegant female office worker. The description is extremely different every time. Shockingly, this attacker strikes someone right next to them, so Totomaru chases after him while Kabosemi checks on the victim and calls for backup. The guy knocks a girl over, and with nowhere else to go, he runs into a shop. Totomaru detains everyone in the shop, but can't tell who the perpetrator is since they must have taken off their hoodie. Kawasemi reveals that the victim didn't survive, so this is now a murder investigation. 
Toto explains that the culprit has to be in the shop since the emergency exit is completely blocked by boxes. There is no other way out aside from the front entrance, so the mad chameleon is among them. Kawasemi declares that he will take a look at each of the suspects, and everyone prepares to see his eagle eyes in action. Kawasemi begins as usual, but shockingly reveals that he doesn't see anything. Just then, Toto gets a call from Komonahashi, and Toto tells him everything. Komonahashi shows his genius once again, as he can instantly tell that this isn't a matter of disguise. He asks Totomaro why the culprit would appear different every time. Toto has no clue, so Komonahashi decides to just explain in person. At the shop, the detectives are told that there are no cameras there. Kawasemi explains that based on the angle that the victim was struck, he determines that the attacker must be over 5 feet 6 inches tall. Toto confirms that the red hoodie guy was about that height, so they can narrow the suspects down to three men. Kawasemi tries to use his eagle eyes to narrow the suspects down even further, but he fails once again. They have all the suspects' information, so for now, they just let them leave. Kawasemi is ashamed of what he has become and thinks he is undeserving of the eagle eye moniker. Just then, Komonahashi arrives, but has been arrested for being suspicious. Kawasemi remembers him as the puppet master, but Komonahashi reveals that today, he is known as nearsighted Kamasemi. Kawasemi reminds the guys that he already understands them and asks for Komonahashi's help. Toto is impressed with him as it's clear that he knows that Komonahashi was really the one that solved the hand collector case. Komonahashi instantly starts investigating and wonders why the victim was wearing a suit if he is a university student. Kawasemi assumes that he must have been job hunting since two other previous victims were doing the same thing. Komonahashi correctly assumes that all the victims were wearing suits and explains that this is the mystery that will lead them to solving the case. He then shockingly states that the only way the attacker's appearance can change every time is if all the victims are lying. The guys can't understand why the victims would lie, but Komonahashi assumes that it's because of a guilty conscience. Komonahashi hints at a reason for all the students wearing suits, and Kawasami picks up on it and says it must be an It's Me scam. All of the victims were money collectors in a type of scam. They wore suits to pose as bank workers and walk around in broad daylight collecting money. The victims determined that if the culprit was caught, then they would all be exposed for being part of a scam, so they lied. The culprit must be part of the scam and there was likely trouble over money. This person was also taking their phones to cover up any contact with the group in charge of the scam. Kawasemi is amazed by Komonahashi, but Komonahashi says that the real Kawasemi would have figured this out a long time ago. Komonahashi wants Kawasemi to figure out the rest, but he states that he can't. Komonahashi insists and plans to scold him if he doesn't. Komonahashi then steals his eagle eye tweezer act and starts picking apart all of Kawasemi's flaws. He reminds Kawasemi that his tanking performance is affecting his old partner since he idolized him so much. Komonohashi antagonizes him further, so Kawasemi gets really upset. He finally stops worrying about trying so hard and stops holding back. Kawasemi shows how his eagle eye thing is really done as he points out all the price tags still attached to Komonohashi's suit. His footwear is atrocious and his tie is all messed up. Toromaro can't believe that Komonohashi is dressed so poorly and wonders if he did it on purpose to fix Kawasemi. Komonohashi points out that Kawasemi is just fine and tells him to turn his eagle eye onto the suspects. Kawasemi instantly reverts to his old self and begins questioning how the suspect intentionally elbowed some random lady. He deduces that the man didn't actually elbow her and was actually checking the time on his watch. There was a sign about restricted access during certain times so he thought the route would be clear. The path was actually blocked off, so he had to hide in the shop. The only way the culprit could have made this mistake is if his watch was broken and showed the wrong time when he checked it. Of the three suspects, only one was wearing a broken watch, so Kawasemi determines that he is the culprit. They try to get into contact with the culprit, but the stupid cops find out that all the information he gave was fake. Kawasemi isn't concerned, however, as they didn't find the victim's phone on any of the suspects, so it must be in the store. The red hoodie is found, but still no cell phone. Komonohashi reveals that they have already seen the phone, and strangely says that it's in the middle of a phone call. Toto has no clue what he is talking about, but Kawasemi figures it out. Later that night, the culprit returns to the scene of the crime and goes to retrieve the phone that's on a mannequin. Cops spring out of nowhere, and Kawasemi tells the guy that he's being arrested. 
The guy is taken away, and Kawasemi fixes Kimu's tie, showing that he has finally returned to being his old self. On their way back, Toto informs Komonohashi that the mad chameleon has been caught. Komonohashi reveals that the business he went to take care of was going to a research center. He informs Toto about the test he has been taking, and explains that depending on the diagnosis, there may be a way to alleviate his symptoms. Toto wants to celebrate the hope of curing his illness, but something isn't sitting right with Komonohashi. Later, Komonohashi asks Toto Maro if he should start investigating the case of Spitz's missing family. Toto says that Spitz has been helping them with cases, so they should help him. Komonohashi agrees and tells Toto to inform Spitz. Toto doesn't know why he wants him to do it, and is shocked when Komonohashi reveals that it's because Spitz is currently tailing him. The two go to Komonohashi's apartment, where Toto's in utter disbelief to see that he has furniture now. Komonohashi made it more comfortable, so they could bring clients there, and their first will be Spitz. Komonohashi explains that Spitz is acting a bit weird because he asked him for something. Komonohashi wants him to get his bloody training incident file from Blue before he begins the investigation. Komonohashi already obtained Scotland Yard's files on the case, but a crucial section was removed. He wants Spitz to get the full file by breaking into Blue. Toto assumes that he wants to prove his innocence, but Komonohashi is more interested in something else. Mofu told him that his culprit killing disorder may have been caused by some kind of medical intervention. There were three hours that he doesn't remember from when he was being treated after the incident. The records from that time were also removed from the file. The missing part could help him figure out his disorder, and it could hold the secret of who it was that stole five years of his life from him. Komonohashi tells Spitz to get the file, but Toto thinks that Komonohashi should look for his family either way. Komonohashi explains that the odds of finding Spitz's family is incredibly low, and they are not doing charity work. Toto fights for Spitz, who he calls their friend, and Komonohashi seems to have planned this entire argument as he smiles. Spitz breaks down and thanks Toto, since his words are all that he needed to hear. Spitz apologizes for hesitating and accepts Komonohashi's conditions. With that settled, Komonohashi is ready to start investigating. Toto says it will take time for them to get ready to travel to Europe, but Komonohashi shocks him when he reveals that their investigation will start in Japan. The investigation to find Spitz's brother then begins. Spitz's brother did a lot of traveling, studying people's beliefs, so the first place they are checking is called Yadamura, a village Spitz's brother visited frequently. Just then, they spot a snake, but Komonohashi tells everyone to be quiet as he hears something. He rushes off and finds a waterfall. A strange girl is just staring at it, and she is by a shrine. Just then, an axe comes flying out of nowhere, but the guy that threw it says it just slipped out of his hand. He apologizes and tells them to be careful around there. As the guys approach Yadamura, they find the mayor in the middle of an argument. The mayor remembers Spitz and explains that they are arguing about the construction of a dam. A government official is demanding that everyone in the village move out. All the villagers keep saying that someone named Yaragami won't allow them to build a dam and drown the town. Yaragami is apparently some kind of night snake god. A deity said to have protected their village since ancient times. Some other guy that studied people's beliefs is named Murray, and he explains that he came there to investigate Yaragami. The mayor tries to calm everyone down as the government official is only there to survey the area. The villagers aren't stupid though, and know that if he does that, then the dam will likely get approved. If that happens, then they will all be at the bottom of the dam soon. This survey guy is a real jerk, as he tells the mayor that he needs to stop teaching the villagers about false gods, and he should be teaching them about manners. He explains that he will conduct the survey the next day, and he will sue them if they interfere. The villagers are furious, but the mayor sends everyone home. The mayor explains that the government official is staying in the guest hut, so he invites Spitz and his friends to stay at his house. That night it rains, and the mayor calls it Yadagami's rage, as sometimes even gods can't hold back their anger. The girl from the waterfall arrives, and Spit recognizes her as Mai. She is the mayor's granddaughter, and she is glad to hear that Spitz will be staying with them for a while. At dinner, Spitz shows the guys a picture of his brother from the day before he went missing. They were going around asking villagers about legends of Yadagami. They slept at the guest hut after, but when Spitz woke up, his brother was gone and he was never seen again. Police and villagers even looked for him deep in the mountains, but there were no signs that he ever left the village. It was as if he just vanished. 
The tone changes quickly as Komonhashi reveals his dinner that is covered in black sugar syrup. Totomaro notices that they can see the guest hut from where they are but is stunned by something. The others go to look and are shocked to see that a giant snake is staring right at them. It also seems to be wrapped around someone so they rush to investigate. They get to the only entrance to the guest hut but Komonohashi stops them. The mud is wet from the rain but there are no footprints so that means no one has gone in or out. They proceed to find that the door is unlocked and they hear a thumping sound inside. The place is completely empty and it's almost like what they saw has completely vanished. The police arrive the next morning and we see that the lifeless body of the official was found by the waterfall. On his neck is bruising that resembles the scales of a snake. It has been determined that the cause of death was trauma to the head from falling into the basin and no weapons have been found. The marks on his neck look like snake scales but it has been determined that they are from a rope. Komonohashi does his thing where he promises to avenge the victim and asks for the victim to speak to him. The mayor arrives to say that the snake god Yadagami did this. Toto points out that there were no signs of entry into the hut but the mayor says that Yadagami has the power of a god and could easily have done it. Mai then arrives upset and reminds the mayor that outsiders are not allowed into the waterfall. The mayor explains that he has given them permission and reveals that they are detectives. Mai wonders who Komonohashi is so Spitz jumps in to say that he is just a friend of his. They share interests and collect rare wrapping paper together. Komonohashi wonders what Mai was doing by the shrine when they arrived and she explains that she was leaving an offering for Yadagami. It's tradition for a villager to make an offering every day as they thank their god for protecting them. Komonohashi wonders if they all truly believe in Yadagami but Mai is offended that he would even question their faith. She says that Yadagami has always existed and will continue to exist. After a moment's hesitation, the mayor jumps in to agree with her. He points out that the divine punishment handed down to the official is proof that Yadagami exists. Toto is shocked to see that the villagers have appeared and the angry mob agrees with the mayor. The guys get out of there and Komonohashi points out that when beliefs are coupled with exclusion, it can sometimes present as a state resembling mass hypnosis. He wonders what is driving them to believe so deeply and Murray appears out of some bushes. He explains that he has studied a countless number of gods around the world but Yadagami is unique. His legend is still alive and there are even reports of his power of vanishment. He reveals that there was a plan to build a dam in the village 15 years ago just like there are now. However, when it came time for construction, all the heavy machinery disappeared. Spitz's brother also seemed to vanish 11 years ago. Murray explains that while staying in the village, it's impossible not to feel Yadagami's power. He explains that he once fell down the mountain and lost consciousness. When he came to, he was no longer on the mountain and found himself lying at its foot instead. This psycho explains that he has been so intrigued with what's happened, he has been considering coming to live in the village. Komonohashi wonders where he was when it was raining the day before and he explains that he was at the shrine. The shrine holds the shed skin of a huge snake but it also holds eyes and fangs. There are also some scrolls and old manuscripts depicting Yadagami. He found out that it was closed for some reason so he went back to the house he's staying in. Afterwards, Spitz feels like something was off about their conversation so Toto suggests that they sort out the sequence of events. At dinner, they saw the snake wrapped around someone. At the hut, there were no footprints and all the windows have bars on them. No one got in or out but they heard a loud bang. They wonder what the sound could have been and freak each other out when Spit wonders if it was the sound of Yadagami teleporting. Komonohashi likes a good legend just like anyone else but he is sure that there must be another explanation. The guys are allowed back inside the hut and Toto wonders how the snake could have vanished. He is certain that they saw it and wonders if there is some hidden door. The cop reveals however that they searched the entire place. The dust beneath the roof was undisturbed and there are no signs that anyone had been up there. The walls and bars are sturdy and can't be removed. There are also no places to hide under the floor. They did find something strange and Toto is shocked to see that it's some of Komonohashi's black sugar syrup. Komonohashi explains that he had it in his mouth when they rushed to the hut and he just lost it. Toto apologizes to the cop for the syrup staining the mats but it was just a mistake. This means they have no clues so Spitz is stunned that Yaragami must really exist. He remembers his brother and states that he would have been powerless against the god. Just then Spitz is startled 
as he says that he can see the giant white snake in the river. The guys go to look, but they don't see it. Komonohashi seems to realize something and has a look around the hut. He then wonders where the syrup was found. The cop explains that they replaced the mats after they turned them over, so the syrup was just where it is now. Komonohashi acts like Toto's expression says that he has seen through Yaragami's disappearing act. Toto realizes that this must mean Komonohashi has solved the case, but as always, Komonohashi will be giving him the credit. Komonohashi does his cool guy pose and says that living legends are created by the living. Totomaro then gathers everyone and goes over everything. He explains that Komonohashi dropped some black sugar syrup, but when they found it the day after, the bottle was some distance from the spill. Spit said he saw the snake in the river, but when they checked, they found a stone with a rope tied to it. He then shocks everyone when he reveals that what happened was actually a trick. The yaragami that they saw that night was a painted scroll affixed to a floor mat. The culprit stood the mat upright, stuck the scroll on the back, and used the rope to hold it up. One end of the rope was shut in the door, while the other was tied to a rock hanging outside the window. This way, the moment they opened the door, the rope was freed and the stone at the other end fell into the river with the rope. The bang they heard was just a mat falling back to the floor. The reason the bottle rolled away from the stain was because the culprit had lifted the mat to get the scroll. The culprit didn't want villagers getting accused of murder, so they planned it to seem impossible. For this trick to work, the culprit needed someone to witness everything. Toto's room had a clear view of the hut and the person that led them to this room was the mayor. Everyone is shocked by this revelation, but the mayor points out that a weapon hasn't even been found yet. The confident Toto begins to panic as he realizes that this is a pretty important part, but Komonohashi helps him out. He reminds Toto that the rope outside the shrine had been tied differently than how it was the day before. Toto reveals that this was the weapon and forensics will surely find the skin cells of the victim and the mayor. The villagers are stunned and Mai tries to defend her grandpa. The mayor stops her, however, and admits to everything. He hated the official for wanting to build a dam, so he called him out there and took his life. Toto knows something else and tells the old man to give his other reason for doing it. Before he can reveal what he is hiding, Komonohashi succumbs to his own powers and instructs the old man to fall into the river. He wants the mayor to console the dead with his own death. Totomaru expected this, and Komonohashi does the thing with his eyes and tells the man to jump into the waterfall. The old guy prepares to take a dive as everyone just watches, but Toto saves him just in time. Everyone is relieved as Toto tells Grandpa not to worry, but the ground breaks beneath their feet. Spitz rushes to his friend and finds that Toto is just barely holding on to the ledge with the old man. Komonohashi just now regains consciousness and sees a mysterious person emerge from the forest to launch a rope. Komonohashi rushes to help Toto and they grab onto the rope. Afterwards, Grandpa hopes that Mai will find happiness and he is taken away to live out his remaining years in prison. When they return to the village, Komonohashi tells someone that has been following them to come out. He knows it's the person that threw the rope and the guy shocks everyone when he turns out to be Spitz's brother. Totomaru reveals that they realize that he was there the moment Murray told his story about passing out on the mountain. They determined that someone living in the mountain must have saved him. Then, when Mai was at the shrine, she had an insulated bag with her, so they figured she was leaving food for someone on the mountain. Also, Mai seemed surprised to see Spitz, and it was as if she mistook him for his brother. His brother is glad that Spitz made some smart friends, but Spitz just wants answers. Fifteen years ago, the mayor told Spitz's brother about the dam that was being built, so he suggested that they use the legend of Yaragami to play a trick. He was only kidding, but when he returned to his country, he learned that the mayor had hidden the heavy machinery in the mountains. Four years after that, Spitz's brother's life changed completely. He learned something that caused a certain organization to come after him. Spitz desperately wants to know which organization, but his brother explains that he could never tell him for any reason. If he did, then they would be in great danger. After he evaded the ones pursuing him, he decided to just disappear. He took advantage of helping the village stall the building of the dam and took shelter in the mountains while the villagers pretended not to know he was there. Unfortunately, Spitz's brother blames himself for the mayor's actions. The official discovered that he was hiding in the mountains. He could tell that something wasn't right and demanded money in exchange for keeping their secret. 
His demands kept escalating, so that is when the old man decided that it was time to take him out like a cold-blooded assassin. Spitz's brother doesn't feel right about it at all and asks Totemaru to arrest him. Everyone objects, but Spitz's brother feels responsible. Komonahashi interjects and wonders if the old guy was really trying to protect him. He predicts that Grandpa was really just trying to protect Mai's feelings for Spitz's brother, and this is the first time he realizes this. Komonahashi heads home as he doesn't want to get rained on, so Toto explains that the case has been solved, and they will leave it at that. The lovebirds can finally be happy, and Spitz is grateful for his friends. Sometime later, Spitz breaks into blue and is determined to repay Komonahashi for his help. Unfortunately, he is instantly found by the principal, who already knows what he is looking for. She warns him of the consequences for his actions, but Spitz owes Komonahashi everything, and he's ready to accept any punishment. This is exactly what the principal was hoping to hear, and stuns Spitz when she reveals that she has a favor to ask of him. Later, the boys meet up at Komonahashi's apartment, but he is stiff with nerves as he awaits to see if Spitz got the file. Unfortunately, Spitz says that the file wasn't there. However, he reveals that the principal did send him an important message. It's on a tablet, but it will disappear after he opens it. It's ciphered and the guys are surprised when it asks for a password made up from personal information from Komonahashi's two companions. This makes it clear that the principal wanted them to hear the message too, so he reads it out loud. The message explains that the situation is dire. The truth behind the bloody training incident has already been erased from both the police's files and Blue's. She reveals that a blood stain that was neither his or the victim's was found at the scene. No one could solve the case of the locked room, so suspicion of Komonahashi could not be cleared. Furthermore, John's death and the mark found at the scene has made her realize something. The incident from five years ago was committed by a certain organization, and Komonahashi was falsely accused. The mark that appeared during treatment was likely inflicted at the same time as his culprit killing disorder. The guys are then shocked when she suspects that the organization behind it all is the House of M. They are the most notorious criminal family in history. It is said that any crimes they commit will never be solved. The message goes on to reveal that there is a mole from the House of M within Blue, so she has to act with caution. She looks forward to the day when Komonahashi can prove his innocence so she can reinstate his detective's license. The principal was close friends with his parents, so she was overjoyed to hear that he has made some good friends. She asks them to take care of Komonahashi and tells them all to be careful. Toto angrily wants to go after the House of M, but Spitz warns against that. Anyone that has tried to solve cases involving them have all died mysterious deaths. Toto had no idea a group could be so dangerous and gets really worried for his friend. The moment gets really tense, but Komonahashi shocks everyone when he reveals that he is so excited that he can't stop trembling. As long as they keep solving cases, the House of M will surely show themselves again. When that time comes, they won't let them get away, and he vows to drag the House of M into the light. Elsewhere, we get a glimpse of just how evil the House of M is. Their leader receives a report that one of their members is having a baby, and he doesn't want to be a criminal anymore. This leader agrees that it would be best to eliminate this member. However, he doesn't want the guy's unborn child coming for revenge in 15 years, so he orders that the guy's entire family be eliminated. Another member named Winter wonders why they're allowing some half-blood to live. His older brother is the leader, and he can tell that Winter is talking about Komonahashi. The reason is that Komonahashi is part of the family, and he carries the same blood they do. Winter is upset about something that happened to Alice, so the leader clarifies that only those in their family that excel are allowed to live. The leader wonders if Komonahashi is worthy of being their brother, so that is what they're trying to determine. Winter gets furious and reminds his brother that Komonahashi has Sherlock's blood as well, so he will never consider him his brother. The leader antagonizes Winter by bringing up Alice, and explains that despair is the only way for them to both get what they want. The House of M's crimes have long been ruined by Sherlock Holmes and his descendants. Komonahashi carries his blood so they cannot allow him to become a detective. That is why they must bestow despair onto him. They will determine if he is worthy of joining the House of Moriarty after he has completely given up on his deductions. This leader is the firstborn of the family named Milo Moriarty and he tells Winter that he has a ticket to Japan waiting for him. 
As Winter leaves, he explains that he will be extremely thorough. Winter is tasked with bringing despair to Komonahashi, so Milo tells him to give Komonahashi a terrifying taste of the House of Moriarty. Thanks for watching this full season 1 recap. Sign up to my free newsletter if you want to show some support to the channel, link is in the description.